It's Red Eye Radio. Gary McNamara and Eric Harley talk about everything from politics to social issues and news of the day. Whether you're up late or you're just starting your day, welcome to the show from the Uniden America Studios. This is Red Eye Radio. Hello and welcome. He is Gary McNamara. I'm Eric Harley as we begin a Thursday. It just might be all over the place Thursday once again. Gary, how are you? Uh, I'm doing really good, and we were just, sorry, we were just having some old man talk. Yeah, uh, I went to my doctor. Yeah, so I was just... It uh, was weird that they're giving out lollipops. <laughs> like, wait, wait, is it, you know, it, it up until the age of 10 and then starting at a certain age? Uh, yeah, no, we were talking uh, health yeah. issues. Well, yeah. well, I mean, I just, I was just talking to you about the, the fact of how quickly I have my normal doctor's appointment next week. So, I mean, there's nothing, just nothing wrong. <laughs> Everything's fine. Yeah. But you're old. Yeah. They, they, <laughs> they, we go every other week. But they, they, did, <laughs> they did my blood work yesterday. And this morning, I mean, it was by noon when I, when I checked my email, it's like, your blood work's back. I went, really? Yeah. And quick? Yeah. And, uh, and so uh, they're sending now. I always would get my blood work back, you know, on the, on the app, mm-hmm. you know, on mm-hmm. the portal. Mm-hmm. And the doctor would give his comments. Right, right. And it yeah. said, you know, you get these now without, you know, your doctor has not looked at them yet. Yeah, like, it changed oh, with my doctor a few years ago where they were like, okay, don't read into it, and then we'll get with you on these numbers, and if there's anything out of range, we'll <laughs> yeah, but let you know. I actually wrote him a message on the portal saying, all right, I checked this. This looks good. This is, you know, I went through the whole thing. And he just told me, he goes, yeah, he goes, uh, very few people understand their blood work. He goes, yeah, but you do. <laughs> well, it's I, you know, it, when you go as often, it's like, yeah. you know, you're, and then all of a sudden, it's like you're doing a conference. Well, listen, I concur, doctor. I think with the uh, treatment going forward should be. Wait a minute, you're the patient. Uh, I did all of my numbers were within range. I went last week. All my numbers were within range except for one uh, personality, and it was a, a dull. <laughs> it said dull. That's all it said. Out of range. Dull in all caps. Dull, D-U-L-L. I'm like, well, that's not very nice. Well, as a as a type two diabetic, we're well, you know, always watching it. And, yeah, I yeah. Mean, I'm I'm not I I'm not to that level of having you know, as they call it, the damage level. Mm-hmm. Um, and so everything is fine. But he grades me. Yeah, I get a grade. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and so far it's always been. And this is seven, almost seven and a half years. Since I was diagnosed with type two, and so I get mm-hmm. an A plus, which is your type two diabetic under control, which yeah. means your blood level, your blood sugar, isn't doing any damage to your body. Yeah, so. uh, I uh, have a condition called uh, hypochondria, and so I go uh, every other day. <laughs> anybody want to take a full blood count? <laughs> no, we we're not going to do that again. Um, but no. Um, you know, I go a few times a year. My mom's always on me. Are you going to, Mom? I'm going to the doctor so often, and uh, and it's good. I, I've had the same doctor's office uh, for many years. Uh, my one doctor, my main doctor, uh, moved to San Antonio to well take care of his elderly parents. We're about the same age. I was always kind of uncomfortable. Well, for a while, I was uncomfortable with that. I was like, I want my doctor to be much older than. I want them to have more life experience my, than I do. <laughs> my doctor, my doctor is three months older than me. Yeah. Well, see, my yeah. yeah. Okay, so they're so you're in the same yeah. and age. Could, and my yeah. mine, yeah. we were within a year of each other, I think. And then now the doctor that took over, she's also in the same age group. She looks a lot younger than I do, but that's not saying much. Most everybody does that my age, and then it, but it it always well, for a while, it didn't settle well with me. You know, who who was it? Was it Brian Regan or some comedian that did a bit years ago on, you know, the doctor? Oh, Brian Regan did a bit of a doctor walking in and he had his his coat, his, you know, the, the coat that doctors wear. It was misbuttoned. It was off by a button. And he said, you know, I don't think I can go back to that doctor because if you can't get down, you know, if you can't get dressed, if you can't get that down, then. I don't know. I don't know how you completed med school, but I was for a while there. I had a problem with having a doctor that was the same age as me. I was for some reason it was too much TV. 
you know, I wanted a TV, I wanted a TV doctor that was much older. But what do you think, doctor, in your 90 years of experience as a doctor? And so I was, you know, uh, well, for a while there, I had a problem with that. But, um, yeah, hopefully everything is uh, is good next week. So, you know, for you. Well, yeah, I mean, I yeah. got the blood work, so yeah. it is. Yeah. <laughs> well, your doctor's visit, you said, is next week. Right, but I, yeah. but he's, he's just. I'm not trying to make you paranoid. <laughs> But you know, there've been some rumors. <laughs> we've we've been wondering. No, I'm a, uh actually I have you know the my, my when I think about my health, the one thing I'm happiest about is I now have a great golf swing that doesn't hurt my back. Yeah, okay. That, that's that's yeah. my major health concern there you right go. now. So. All right. <laughs> but I take that seriously. Well, I brought in, you know, what's interesting is, is we went fishing, me and my brother-in-law, we both brought in these, these, uh, uh, sizable redfish. They were good. They were outside the Texas slot limit. So we only got to keep one each. Uh, we had our tags, uh, for one each and, uh, mine was roughly 27, 28 pounds, which is a good size fish, but I'm thinking, Wow, that seemed much heavier. Wow. Yeah, I can imagine that. Yeah, no. I, I mean, it seems that. when it's in the water, it's it's easier. I mean, you're fighting it. Um, but then you start to, to lift it, and you get it. Uh, the uh, the deck hand got it in the net for me, and then we got it in and then held it up. Once you hold it up, though, you know, for the picture and everything, you realize, okay, yeah, that's about right. It just seemed heavier, and I thought, man, I need to <laughs> – I'm in bad shape. You know, 27 pounds doesn't seem like a – who was it? I saw this this fitness guy. Oh, it was a, like a former uh, wrestler. He said, you know, I can only curl like 20 or 25 pounds now. And I was like, what do you mean only? <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. It seems like a lot. A, I'm doing the 2.2 barbells. <laughs> you know, the little pink ones? Yeah, the, the rubber ones? Yeah, that yeah. Was- yeah, 25 is, yeah, that's on the heavy end for me. Well, it's just based on how I work out. Well, you know, I made a great day yesterday when you start going through your emails and the, the headlines of your emails, the the most uh, the uh, the most frequent headline of the e- my emails yesterday um, uh, was, um, oh, let me get, let me make sure I get it to cor- correct exactly how I mm-hmm. uh, put it uh, uh, yesterday. Yes. Slob elitism. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the number one headline of the emails that I got yesterday, and that was the whole, the whole thing about Fetterman, and I just yeah. decided to call it slob elitism. And it was like, <laughs> apparent, yeah. apparently, that hit a, that, was, I mean, it hit a good, I mean, nobody was upset. Right. Uh, you know, uh, about it. You know, the other thing I, I learned yesterday, too, of this I didn't know, hmm. except for Feinstein, Fetterman has missed the most time. I wasn't aware of that. Yep. And National Review had an article, does he even want to be? He talks, I, I he saw comes, that one, and, it, and the yeah. editors wrote the slob wins, the other one, yeah. on, on that based and, on the dress. But, yeah, does, does he it, want to be a And center? it was like he complains all the time that we're not really doing anything. It's like, mm-hmm. why are you even there? Right. Yeah, no, do you actually want to be yeah. here? Yeah. Well, no, I mean, you know, we they said that about Obama when he became president. He loved the idea of campaigning. He loved the idea of being a rock star. But remember, uh, Mr. Tingly Legs, Chris Matthews, you have to go back a few years for that one, don't you? (laughs) He even said at the end of 2011, everybody was speculating whether he would run again, whether Obama would run for a second term based on the fact that he didn't like the gig. You know, and and that's what's uh, uh, interesting. And by the way, we'll get to the Merrick Garland stuff. Just you know, we yeah, know we're going to cover yeah. everything. It's, but, yeah, all over the place Thursday. Yeah, yeah, this is this is the mind drifts Thursday. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but uh, uh, I saw it was I just saw the headline yesterday. Ted Cruz says that Biden is going to drop out and Michelle Obama will jump in. And and I went mm, probably Obama hated the gig so much and she hated it. Now I will give, I will I will. I will give one point that I think is solid. Not that Michelle Obama is going to run, but they want to get something like Michelle Obama because if you can get somebody who is basically a celebrity who has no background 
and no record on anything. Mm-hmm. For example, Mer- uh, uh, Merrick Garland, uh, <laughs> Gavin Newsom, if he runs, it's California versus, you know, Florida. Or yeah, it's due. Right. And, and, and I mean, even, it doesn't even matter whether it's DeSantis, you know, that gets the nomination. And at the moment, it doesn't look like he's going to. But it's still going to be, do you wish to be California? Mm-hmm. And that's a huge, that's a huge problem if you're running for president of the United States right now. If you know, you're going to run. But Michelle Obama mm-hmm. has no record. Now, she does have a ton of baggage, and that would be her husband. Right. But the, the but fact, for the left, but that's the fact not is, baggage, I mean, there, right? I never yeah. saw any indication. In fact, any story that I ever saw, any story mm. that came out about a Michelle Obama, which she hated being in the White House. Yeah, yeah. Now Obama himself, Barack didn't want to be there. And remember, as you, it's important for people to understand, we had asked that question over and over again. It seems like he doesn't want to be there. You know, he really doesn't meet with anybody, and all of a sudden, even one his day, own party, his own party, right? And all of a sudden, Chris uh, Matthews come out, comes out one day on MSNBC and says the guy doesn't like the gig. He doesn't like the gig. He doesn't want to meet with anybody. He just wants to say we should do this, and the underlings should take care of it, and he shouldn't have to meet with anybody, right. even members of his own party. He never wanted to meet with the leadership of his own party, and that came from one of the most liberal Democrat analysts out there. Chris Matthews. There were some foreign delegates that were backstage at an event, reportedly, and then he was supposed to, you know, do some photo ops or something. He was supposed to meet with them. They were donors. donors. That's what it was. They were donors, yep. And uh, at a a, a rally. Yeah, it was a rally. It was a rally. And he was supposed to, of course, meet with them, photo ops and the whole thing. It's what you pay for, I guess. And so he just walked out. Yeah, didn't want to do it. Didn't want to do it. See it. You know, it's, it's interesting because... I thought, well, if we're going to get into this whole dream ticket nonsense, I could see Gavin Newsom wanting Michelle Obama. I could see him wanting her. I don't think I'm, I don't think she wants the gig. But then the left would go crazy, and why is that? They would love it, and here's why. Now everybody would say, well, no, she wants to be on the top of the ticket. Well, here's what you get, though: you get Gavin Newsom for eight years, and then the idea would be to get Michelle Obama for eight years. Democrats control the White House for 16 years with that ticket. Now, it doesn't work that way. (laughs) But if we're going to get into the dream ticket nonsense, then why not? And it is nonsense. I mean, it just doesn't work that way. By the end of that second term for whoever's on the top of the ticket, then you're dealing with baggage and everything else from, you know, and it doesn't matter how great the presidency is in that eight years. Just ask Joe Biden. So uh, it, that that was interesting uh, uh, yesterday. Yeah. Well, uh, what we got out of uh, m- uh, what I got out of Merrick Garland uh, yesterday is um, the fact that he appointed the special counsel for the exact reason that we were against a special counsel mm-hmm. being appointed. Yep. And that is. I'm not going to answer any questions. Right. The report will be out, right. which means. Two, three, four years from now, you'll get a report on it, and he's not really going to comment on it. And he asks absolutely no questions and is clueless about what goes on in his Department of Justice. And I don't think that's over-the-top rhetoric if you watched it. No, no, I I think it it could be the case where the headline is, uh, President Malia Obama releases report from the Justice Department. Well. Well, the one the years one, from now, decades from right. now, the one question that, you know, the because he his opinion of the whistleblowers is they're all wrong and it's just an opinion. And right. That, and yeah. that and that Weiss right. always had the power to do everything. Right. He, Weiss could have done whatever he wanted. The, the mm-hmm. question is, well, then why does it need to be special counsel? Right. Why, why is it, Why appoint that? Right. Why the only it, reason right. you appoint that is to keep this thing on the back burner right. for years. Right. Well, if you, because what there's there, you know, the 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 point is, if he didn't have all the power to do it, as the whistleblower said, he said in a meeting, mm-hmm. and it's more than one person who has said that that he didn't have the authority to do it. In uh, both uh, uh, in Washington and also in in California, mm-hmm. 
he couldn't do it, that would be why you would get you would you know jump up to special counsel status, right? Because yeah. you're saying, well, I didn't have the authority to do it. Special counsel status gives me the ability to prosecute anywhere. I mean, right. that's what that's what everyone, even the left, was reporting when this happened. Well, if that was the case, now he can do it, right? And it's like, well, no, he has to do it. Well, did you ask him why? No, I didn't ask him why. He just he just wanted to do it. Yeah. I asked no questions about anything because I don't want to interfere. Well, well you can ask. You're not you asking ask, about the you can case. You ask questions. You're asking about why do you wish to change your job description. Right. That's not asking about Hunter Biden. Right. But he is... But he turned everything off. No, 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 Mer- we're not going to approach You know something? It. Merrick Garland comes off. He's one of those people that has a personality like he's your friendly grandfather. Mm-hmm. And he's the biggest slime ball you could possibly imagine. Well, He a, uses that to hide yeah. his sliminess. There's, if you read the transcript versus his demeanor, yeah, it's yep. very different. We got a great show ahead. 866-90 Red Eye. Did you know that up to half of all major engine failures are due to poor cooling system maintenance? That's a lot of downtime and can cost drivers big. You expect a lot from your engine, which is why the cooling system must be a part of your maintenance routine. Here's a tip to keep your cooling system in shape and your engine running smooth. Have the system properly flushed whenever the coolant is changed. Over time, contaminants from seals, oil, and fuel are released into the system and must be removed. And remember, flushing the system with the right coolant mix and water dilution is crucial. If you have cooling questions or need an expert to help flush your system, have your cooling system inspected by a professional technician. This report is brought to you by Shell Rotella. Shell Rotella, with advanced synthetic technology, is designed to help keep your rig running with more mileage and less maintenance. We'll be right back with more Red Eye Radio with Eric Harley and Gary McNamara. It's Red Eye Radio. He's Eric Carley, and I'm Gary McNamara. we got tons of audio today, including uh, uh, from the Merrick Garland uh, testimony. Mm. Just uh, to uh, start this all off, just reading Jonathan Turley yesterday, Garland just admitted. Now, understand Jonathan Turley, the constitutional law professor, is a Democrat. Mm-hmm. Just, we always want to, you know, have, you know, premise it with that. Garland just admitted to Chairman Jordan that he never considered anyone else for the special counsel position. He said it would be, would be disruptive to appoint anyone else. Yet, a bit of disruption is precisely what many were hoping for in the light of the whistleblowers and the botched plea deal. Even liberal pundits have described the handling of the investigation an unholy mess. Disrupting an unholy mess does not seem like a bad idea. What is striking, and this is what got to me from the parts I saw, what is striking is the lack of curiosity of the Attorney General General of the United States He was repeatedly asked about major scandals at his department, and he insisted that he only knew what was in the media. Matters raised two years ago to Garland remained a mystery to him. He's BSing, that's why. Likewise, time and time again, he says decisions are left to others. He appears to be a mere pedestrian in the work of his own department. Thus far, the consistent message of the attorney general has been to go pound sand that is precisely why trust in his department has plummeted under his watch. Garland has a valid objection to some questions, but he can answer some of those questions, but he has chosen not to. Well, and that's it. He's going to be defiant at every turn. And the move was exactly what we thought it was going to be in assigning special counsel. It's out yeah. of my hands, and I'm not going to touch it.
Gary McNamara and Eric Harley taking your calls. 1-866-90-RED-EYE. It's Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Harley and I'm Gary McNamara. You know, one of the things uh, uh, yesterday with uh, Merrick Garland uh, and the Daily Caller noted this, and, and Jim Jordan did too, but I was just reading from the, the, the Daily Caller and that, uh, you know, the question is where he says David Weiss has full authority during the Hunter Biden investigation. And then he contradicted it here in this little back and forth with Jim Jordan. He did not recognize himself. Quote, Mr. Weiss has full authority to bring cases in other jurisdictions if he feels it's necessary. That was your response, Attorney General, to Senator Grassley's question on March 1st, 2023. He just referenced it when Mr. Bishop was questioning you. Only problem is he'd already been turned down by the U.S. Attorney in the District of Columbia, Mr. Graves. So he didn't have full authority, did he? I had an extended conversation with uh, Senator Grassley at the time. We briefly touched on the Section 515 question and how that process went. Um, I've my never been suggested. My point's real simple, Mr. Garland. You said he had complete authority, but he'd already been turned down. He, he wanted be. to bring an action in the District of Columbia, and the U.S. Attorney there said, no, you can't. And then you go tell the United States Senate under oath that he has complete authority. I'm going to say again that uh, no one had the authority to turn him down. They could refuse uh, to partner with him. They could. I mean, it's just nonsense. I mean, it is. It's just like it was me. like they just took a you know a, a weekend host from MSNBC and put them up there to debate in a nonsense fashion. That's exact. That they don't talk like in this case, Attorney General. We said this going back to Comey. Yeah, Comey did not talk law enforcement language. He didn't speak in those terms. Comey's just weird, and we've learned that and or confirmed that since all of that happened on the Russian hoax. But you look here, and it's the same thing. Merrick Garland. This is a guy who has a vendetta against Republicans, and it goes back to the whole Supreme yeah. Court thing. They, they... <laughs> he had full authority, uh, but they could decide not to partner with him. Yeah, they don't have to partner with him it's just i mean it's it is pulling teeth this is uh north carolina's dan bishop let's go to part of this this is a longer audio cut mm. but it just shows you how it was like yeah you know, it's 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 pulling teeth for yeah. where ultimately though the authority is yours yes you, you made the point that the, you don't take orders from the president about such things you decide ultimately what the justice department will do i announced at the beginning I promised that he would be able to bring whatever cases he wants, and I have followed through on that promise. I'm permitted to make that kind of promise, and I have made it. Did you undertake to inform yourself, to, uh, to interact with him sufficient to ensure that he knew he possessed that authority, or that you would see to it that he had all necessary authority? I don't think there's any doubt that he knew. He has written three letters to this committee indicating that he understood he had that authority. You're also aware, though, aren't you, sir, that an, a senior IRS investigator, whistleblower, came forward and has testified publicly that Mr. Weiss stated that he did not have such authority. He was not the decider. Are you aware of that? I'm aware of the testimony. I was not present at any point during that statement. And Mr. Weiss present? has, in, uh, Mr. Weiss, who was present, has indicated that he had the authority and he knew that he had it. Subsequent to those developments, though, you decided to make Mr. Weiss special counsel, which you had not done before. Mr. Weiss made clear he did not ask me to be special counsel until last month, and last month I made him special counsel. Did you have some lack of information that you should have had it would have caused you to act earlier to make him special counsel. Mr. Weiss did not ask to be special counsel before. I understand he didn't ask. You've said that, sir. Did you take the necessary steps to inform yourself what authority he understood he had or what obstacles he was encountering? Look, Mr. Weiss had, as I said from the beginning, at the very beginning, that he had authority over all matters that pertain to under Biden. Have you... Have you, un have you learned that he was, in fact, deterred by decisions of the United States attorneys in the District of Columbia and the Northern District of California from proceeding as he thought best? With respect, uh, Congressman, 
Mr. Weiss has said, has not said that he was deterred. He said that he followed the normal processes of the department um, and that he was never denied the ability to bring a case in another jurisdiction. Well, what changed then, Mr. Attorney General? What made you decide that it was sufficient to leave him in the situ situation he was until you decided to make him special counsel? Mr. Weiss asked for that authority, given the extraordinary circumstances of this matter, and given my promise that I would give him any resources he requested, I made him special counsel. So until that time, was it just a matter of his predilection, or did you, did you undertake to investigate and discern what he was doing with his authority and, what, and whether he had faced any obstacles? I did not uh, endeavor to investigate because I had promised that I would not interfere with this investigation. The way in to not interfere is to not investigate an investigation. Once he requested to be named special counsel, having not done so over months and months of your tenure, did you ask him what had changed that, that made him now need to be a special counsel? Mr. Weiss asked to be made special counsel. I had promised that I would give him all the resources he needed and I made him special counsel. When did the Justice Department permit statutes of limitations to expire on some of the prospective charges against Hunter Biden for tax violation? I don't know anything about the statute of limitations here. The investigation was in the hands of Mr. Weiss to make the determinants that, determinations that he thought were appropriate. Are you unaware that, tax, that uh, statutes of limitations have in fact been allowed to expire after there having been tolling agreements in place? I'm going to say again, the determination of where to bring cases and which kinds of cases to bring was left to Mr. Weiss. Yes, sir. I understand that you've said that. That's part of the problem. The question is, are you aware that statutes of limitations have been allowed to expire while the matter was under investigation? The investigators were fully familiar with all the relevant law. I'm not asking for the excuses. And I'm they, asking whether you're aware of that fact, sir. I'm going to say again. I'm going to say again and again if necessary. I did not interfere with, did not investigate, did not See, those are, those are statements in response to other questions. Those, Everybody in the country now knows who's paying attention to this, that the Justice Department permitted statutes of limitations to expire. Every lawyer who's ever practiced understands the implications of allowing statutes of limitations to expire. Prosecutors, you do not even know as you sit here whether that occurred or not? Prosecutors make appropriate determinations on their own. In this case, I left it to Mr. Weiss whether to bring charges or not. That would include whether to let statute of limitations expire or not, whether there was sufficient. Again, that's not the question, and that shows where he's BSing. What he's saying is, because the question is, did you know about this? Yeah. yeah. And, he, and he will not answer that question. He brought one set of answers, right. for, and, and, and that was the set he, he stuck with. If you go back in the transcript, there's just stuff that just repeats over and over again. You can see it. The reason I bring up the transcript is because it take, takes the inflection out of it and you can get, you can search things or for things. And he was basically repeating these answers and these answers didn't apply to the questions, questions being, asked. being asked. You it's know, one of the questions I would have said was, is Weiss running the Department of Justice? You know, no, no. you keep bringing this well, up on the re on the request. Here, here's a question that that he that he, that he should have asked, because he was saying that uh, you know Weiss has written three letters saying that uh, that he had uh, the authority to do whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, the whistleblowers and there's more than one is stating he actually said in the meeting, no, he didn't have it. Right. Well, uh, you know, well he has. Well, Weiss has never said that. Well, did you ask him? Right. Did you ask? Because that's not about the Hunter Biden case. No, it's about, it's about his authority. It, it's it's about his it's about the uh, uh, authority and understanding, you know, what's going on, because I that I that I don't I don't that's not interfering in the case. You're simply saying you said three times you've written three things. That now you've got these whistleblowers that stating that you said in a meeting you didn't have it. Did you say that? Right. Because. You had the authority. Why are you telling people you didn't? That's got nothing to do with the actual case against Hunter Biden. It's about the authority. That is, a, It's about the authority, and it's about the credibility of the Department of Justice. Right. And remember, 
Because it builds at, the intent and, of all of this. Right. And at that moment, he wasn't a special counsel either. Right. And and so it doesn't make any sense. And then when you get to the point here where it's like, did you know that the statute of limitations had been passed? And he's making it seem like, no, that I, you know, I, I'm not going to answer that question. Mm-hmm. Why not? Why well, because he's defiant, and that's what it comes down to. He he brought one set of answers, and he repeated many of them over and over again. But uh, this is, uh, you know, as as we stated, and and we who uh, when, when who was some of the Republicans saying that there should be a special counsel, and we said absolutely not, absolutely not. Because... Oh, it was one of the whistleblowers that suggested oh, it yeah, during yeah, testimony. It was. Yeah, okay, yeah. that's who it was, and we said right. absolutely not. Yeah. Absolutely not. There should be no whistleblower because they want to bury this thing. Well, there should be whistleblowers. There shouldn't be a special counsel. Yeah. You said there should be no whistleblowers. There should be no 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 special counsel. counsel. Yeah. (laughs) We want the whistleblowers. (laughs) Yeah. So, uh, like I said, it was it's what I expected. I mean, I'm not surprised. But what happened, Mm. what happened. But again, if uh, you if you look at this and you wonder why the American public. And I know one of the Republicans yesterday was saying that 65% of Americans now don't have credibility in the Department of Justice. I don't know what Polly was referring to there. Mm-hmm. I don't have that. And he said, and it's because of you. Yeah. And, and when you give answers like this, like he did yesterday, where you don't answer the questions and questions that have nothing to do with the investigation, things like, are you aware of what's happening in the world? Yeah. Right. And he will not answer the question. He'll answer another question, but not that question. All he had to say is, look, I'm not going to I'm not going to answer that question because I feel it would affect something in a but he didn't do that. No. And it's like the it's exactly what the reason we didn't want a special counsel is because they wish to bury this. Otherwise, you answer questions that yep. at least make sense. Yep. And for him to not answer the question, is that because he doesn't pay attention to the news and he had no idea what his own damn Department of Justice was doing? No, I think that's that's a, a, a pretty good likelihood, actually. That because it, that it's it gives, an, because that it would it be an gives, embarrassment to him to well, answer it, it to say it I gives him it gives right. him uh, plausible deniability. That one the one of the 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 biggest stories out there concerning yeah. Hunter Biden, which um, the American public is concerned about, because you're talking about evading taxes and not paying your taxes. Right. Nobody gets a pass on that. Right. And you've been investigating it, and it's not a complicated case. No. Of evading taxes, nope. And you basic. just and you just let the statute of limitations your 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 guy just let him go by, and you're saying, "Well, I'm not going to get involved in that." Oh, I can't. That's question a load I, of that's horse. Not, that's right. a load of horsemen, or because he wasn't special counsel when he did that. That reminds me of Mueller. That's not within my purview. You're the attorney general. Well, he was a special counsel. I know. No, I'm talking about Merrick Garland. Oh, okay, it's okay, it's okay, the okay, same okay, type okay, of answer yeah. that the special then special counsel right. gave. Well, it's not in my purview. You're special counsel. Well, I'm not going to. I'm not going to touch this. I'm not going to look at it. I'm not going to ask questions. You're the attorney general. But he can be de- and, as defiant as he wants, and nobody is going to do a damn thing about it. Eight six six ninety red eye. Coming up, more with Gary McNamara and Eric Harley. It's Red Eye Radio. It's Red Eye Radio. He's Eric Harley and I'm Gary McNamara. 
Uh, coming up, well, the Fed doesn't raise rates, but uh, was it the majority of the Fed said, but more rate hikes are coming? Yeah, the uh, the uh, other Fed officials, 12 of the 19, yeah. saying basically, yeah, we're pretty much looking at at least one more by the end of the year. We'll get to that coming up here in just a, uh, a little bit, because it does take me back to the 70s when inflation went on for such a long time. And the question we have is, well, if you know you're going to raise rates again, why not do it now? Right. Why would you why would you wait if right, that's right. where you believe that it's going? So we'll get to uh, that refi mortgage demand went up 13.2 percent. Mm. It says despite high rates. And I was telling you during the our pre-show meeting, I went, but that sort of makes sense. If people have run out of cash. Mm-hmm. They're tapping into the um, equity of their home. You t- exactly. Yep. I mean, that, that, and it doesn't matter what the rates are. Because it wouldn't they're... make sense in a streamlined situation because you wouldn't go from, if you've got lower interest, you know, you're not going to go to paying higher interest in a streamline. Ex- it would be right. about taking some of that yep. equity out in cash. Yep. Top of the Hour News is brought to you by House Products. Visit HouseProducts.com. This is Red Eye Radio on Westwood One. Now, it's Red Eye Radio. Gary McNamara and Eric Harley talk about everything from politics to social issues and news of the day. Whether you're up late or you're just starting your day, Welcome to the show from the Uniden America Studios. This is Red Eye Radio. All across America and around the planet, we are Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Harley, and I'm Gary McNamara. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Download our Red Eye Radio app today. You can listen when and where you want if you uh, cannot listen live overnight. And thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. Oh, I did see CNBC had a thing that the strike might be over, the Hollywood strike. Not the UAW. No. <laughs> I want to make that really clear. <laughs> yeah. The one that quit making the news a long time ago? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I know some people, really? You mean they may be back? Darn. <laughs> yeah. Darn. Uh, yeah. Um. You know, it was uh, I? I for, I think I think it was somebody from National Review. Stuff to again. This is all over the place Thursday, and we're going to get to more audio cuts. But there's other stories we want to make sure that we get in for you. We'll have the audio cuts of of uh, Merrick Garland's non testimony yesterday because <laughs> he really didn't say anything, did he? Think about yeah. this. He was, how long was it? Like four hours, and he said nothing. He got nothing. Yeah, got absolutely nothing. It's basically, well, we have a special counsel now, and uh, so we can't say anything for the, you know, until he puts through his report that could be three years from now. Right. Which we knew was going to happen. Yeah. Uh, hmm. And and so we'll we'll get uh, to uh, back to that here in just uh, a little bit. But, oh, I know the story I want to get to. Okay. Texas Governor Greg Abbott has accused the Biden administration of recently cutting razor wire. The Texas had installed in Eagle Pass. Hmm. The comments were made as Texas officials continue to spar with the White House over the migrant crisis at the southern border. Abbott made the announcement last night. Texas installed razor wire in Eagle Pass to stop illegal crossings. Abbott explained on X, formerly known as Twitter. Today, the Biden administration cut that wire, reopening the floodgates to illegal immigrants. I immediately deployed more Texas National Guard to repel illegal crossings and install more razor wire. This is unbelievable what's going on right now. I mean, you think about it. it you know, you've got New York. Adams is screaming about it. I story in the New York Post yesterday, where you know Adams is you know begging the president to visit. You know these these holding centers for migrants, and Biden will have 
won't communicate with them, wants nothing to do with it whatsoever. In fact, the, the Biden administration wants to extend work visas for Venezuelans. A half a million. Yep. I mean, it's just like, and and he knows, the Democrats know they can't put this, for example, in any type of budget negotiation. Are they going to sit there and ask for $20 billion or $30 billion or $40 billion for the federal government to do this? Because then it becomes news. Mm. That's why they won't do it. Mm-hmm. Well, B- Biden knows this understand the arrogance of this man he knows the country is against what he's doing oh he's, yeah he's going to yeah. he's going to continue yeah. to do it he doesn't if you're a democrat understand he doesn't care if he makes your life hell no he doesn't care for example in new york city where mayor adams a democrat now the city council doesn't be seem to be uh, concerned about it because they're jumping on the reparations bandwagon mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. they're talking about 15% cuts to the city budget because they have to take care of the migrant situation that yeah. Biden has caused. Yeah. The other thing is, too, since the story came out last week, that, wait a minute, out of the 110,000 migrants that are there, only 13,000 came from Texas vast majority came from Biden. Yep. And all of a sudden, the criticism of Abbott has stopped. You know, you think, and if you're a Democrat, you would think that you were probably screaming that Abbott was involved in kidnapping or human trafficking. Well, you would think that they would try to fight that harder, wouldn't you? They're not fighting it. If there was something to it. Well, yeah, that's the point. They're full of it. Yep. And they know it. But they And they can't win this. And... The Democrats, you know, Governor Hochul in New York is trying to keep Adams at bay. Oh, he's handling this poorly. How else do you expect him to handle it? <laughs> By the way, every picture of Mayor Adams right now, he just looks tired, exhausted, probably exhausted with his own party. But sorry, dude, you helped to build this. This is how it goes. This is the, the kind of thing that you ran on, you know, and the whole, you know, again, laughable, we bring this up, but going to the court saying, please help us remove our own sanctuary city policy. And it is laughable because it's not funny. Having grown up on the border and lived in a border state all of my life, I know. No, it's not funny. It's not. No, it isn't funny at all, but it is laughable the way that they try and approach it. But this president absolutely does not care that most Americans are against what he's doing. Well, the humor is based on the hypocrisy of the Democrats. That's where the humor. Right. It's not the situation that's being caused. Right. It's the it's the absolute hypocrisy. And it's about Democrats who believe that the president, when he enacts a policy, will actually, these these local Democrat politicians that actually believe that Biden is going to help them. Well, you're idiots if you believe he is. Right. Because he can't. Yeah. yeah. He can't sit there and say, I'm going to request in the budget $100 billion right. for the migrants because then he's got to sell that to the American public, mm-hmm. and he knows he can't sell it to the American public, and the Democrats know they can't sell that to the American public. So he's just going to continue to do it, put Mayorkas out there saying, oh, no, the border's secure, and we're doing a wonderful job. The things that we have done, the advancement we've made, while everybody is screaming, I mean, you think about the consistent gaslighting that's going on day in and day out about what's going on at the border, and we played yesterday from CNN, from News Nation, from uh, from from uh, CBS, even the networks. Everybody's covering the insanity now back at the border and what's ha- happening right now. And the administration's walking around going, there's nothing wrong here. Everything is working exactly. By the way, they are being honest here. Everything's working exactly like we wanted it to work. Oh, no, it's by design. It's, it's by design. It's going smoothly. It, the border is secure for those who want to come across. And think about this. In one of the, the in one of the most liberal states, New York, 
Biden's just giving Democrats the finger. You yeah. deal with it. Right. I'll make your life and your city, I'll make it a living hell. I don't care whether you're Democrats. Yeah. Will do this to you. Right. They don't care. Biden doesn't care about nope. Democrats. No. Nope. And so that's the interesting thing is this fight is not about, and think about this. The fight wouldn't have happened if Abbott hadn't done it because originally it was, oh, okay, it's Abbott. Yeah. It's, it's, it's Abbott. Mm -hmm. uh, it's um, DeSantis, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're the ones that it's, and so it was, in it, you know, okay, Democrats versus Republican. Well, now we know that stopped last week when the numbers came out. Sorry, of the 110,000 as of last week in New York City, 13,000 came from Texas. Mm -hmm. The rest, the federal government was yep. involved in. Yep. That's the Biden administration. And now, you know, they're screaming. And it's happening whether it's Chicago, whether it's New York, uh, whether it's Los Angeles. It's... It's happening, and it's Democrat versus Democrat. And what they're finding out is the president doesn't give a damn if he makes helps doesn't to care. make your city a living hell. He doesn't care. If they drain your resources, he doesn't care. Because he looks at it and says, and we've said this for the longest time, Democrats believe that the people that vote for them are idiots. We started this narrative when with Obamacare. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why Obama was able to lie right to your face, because he said they don't care. Right. We'll make your life worse. They'll still vote for us. Democratic voters, they believe, are the biggest suckers known to mankind. You know, you look at you look at the whole think about this when you look at the polling out there. The polling out there shows that suburban women are moving more. Uh, towards the Democrats as men are moving in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. This, as the Democratic Party has just spit in the face of liberal feminism mm -hmm. with the radical transgender movement, mm -hmm. are redefining women, are taking opportunity away from women, and women, they look at it and go, women are going, this is great. Yeah, we love it. We love it. We love the misogyny of the Democratic Party. Men, please define women. Yeah. And that's how they look at it. They go, the women are moving towards us. And we are as blatant misogynist as anyone has ever been as a political party mm -hmm. in modern times in the United States. Mm -hmm. So they look at it across the board, whether it's immigration, uh, whether it's the misogyny of their uh, uh, radical transgender uh, movement and their destroying of opportunity for women. And they look at all these things and go, <laughs> We're not really suffering in the polls. Nope. The people that vote for us are complete idiots. We can make their life a living hell. Yep. We can redefine women. We can say that the border is secure and it's not. We can skyrocket energy prices. We can pretend and lie to people that we can run the grid on wind and solar. Mm -hmm. We can sell them the delusion of electric vehicles. We can destroy great union jobs. And women, unions, minorities in in the in the cities were destroying their lives and they love it. Yep. And are asking for more. And asking if you're voting for it, you want more of it. It's the Kevin Bacon and Animal House. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. My have another. Yep. They're still winning elections yep. doing all this. It's a choice. All of these situations that we're in are choices. Each of them. Yeah. It's the the country is where we are today, not because there are problems we can't solve. Right. But that the political party that has been more in power uh is, you know, uh, is doing exactly what they wish to do and what they believe their constituents want them to do because well, they keep voting them in you, power. You look at the whole thing with Venezuela. Yeah. And the work visas. Well, because of the nature of, of what's going on in that nation. You mean that same nation that this same president went and begged for oil from? That one? Yeah. Yeah. There's such... 
they're such a horrible nation where all these people deserve work visas. Right. And the government is horrible. It's these, horrible. These, these Treats are, the people right. horribly. We're going to extend it only for this one nation. Oh, by the way, we're going to go over there and also ask for oil. Yeah. And now we're going to beg the dictator for oil because we won't produce it on our own. Yeah. It's pure insanity. Well, if you're going to build and a socialist society, then what you want to do is bring over more people that are already used to it. <laughs> or maybe... Or, or maybe it's not a great idea because they may be trying to escape it. See, that's what they don't get. Well, they never saw the switch. They never saw. I mean, if you look at it, I mean, it may be slower with blacks, but it's just like with uh, Hispanics. Mm-hmm. They're moving over. I mean, the whole, you think about it, the Democratic Party is becoming the elite rich. Yeah. And it is the, and 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 suburban, well-to-do people and the slowly Mm -hmm. the well actually quite quickly when it comes to hispanics moving much more towards the republican party i mean that's one of the most well-known narratives is the democrats are think about this the democrats are no longer the party of the working guy no i heard that when i grew when i was growing up i heard that more than anything oh that that it would have been a meme if uh, the internet existed back then, and it was simply Republicans are for the rich, Democrats are for the working. Well, felon. no, politically, it was the branding. It was. I mean, it was the branding. That's gone. It's over. I did see a republic or a Democratic representative say, "Oh, the unions know. The unions know that it's uh, that uh, the Democratic Party is the one that uh, that backs them." <laughs> no, they don't. Yeah, right. <laughs> they- <laughs> Sorry, you can't. You're not going to have a strong union if they bankrupt your company. I'll say one thing: your industry, EV mandates. Yeah. Eight six six ninety red eye. This owner operator driver report is brought to you by Shell Rotella. Shell Rotella with advanced synthetic technology is designed to help keep your rig running with more mileage and less maintenance. Surviving and thriving as an owner operator has just as much to do with managing costs as it does with generating revenue. Like the chief financial officer of any company, you have to be concerned about rising costs, especially without increases in revenue. Trying to reduce costs, let alone make sense of them, can be a complicated task. Understanding basic principles of operating costs can save you thousands of dollars a year. A penny saved could be $1,000 earned. Saving just one penny per mile over 100,000 miles driven annually will deliver $1,000 to the bottom line at the end of the year. This report is brought to you by FPPF Fuel Power Max. Get in touch with Red Eye Radio, toll free at 866-90-RED-EYE. It's Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Carley, and I'm Gary McNamara. Coming up following the bottom of the hour, we will get uh, to more of the audio from uh, Merrick Garland. Mm -hmm. Also, could oil go up to $100 a barrel? Mm -hmm. That's really... Yeah, I mean, it's it's been hovering at 91 uh, for a while now. Uh, Well, well over, a you know, I I think on the better part of two weeks now, at least, I'd have to go back and and double check. And... Uh, as we sit right now, just under eighty nine dollars a barrel. So and, yeah, it could go. And it's interesting because I I saw uh, John Carney, who's on Bloomberg all the time, Breitbart economist, mm-hmm. and and he was saying he said he goes, they've really they've tapped everything they can really get out of the strategic oil reserve. Yeah, there's going to be major pushback if they try to do it. And he's like, and so there's nothing they there's nothing left. There's nothing they can do. So it's going to go up to a hundred dollars a barrel. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't see it coming down, he said, because he goes, you know, we're we're producing here in the United States not as much as we could, and it's in, it's increasing. But you've got Saudi Arabia and OPEC and other nations say, no, we want to cut back. We want to keep it at a hundred dollars a barrel. Well, yep. you do, yep. and that's going to keep inflation high across the board. Yep. Which brings me to another. Like I said, it's all over the place. Thursday, mm-hmm. another article that I was reading uh, uh, yesterday, and it was. 
again, this one, again, in National Review, mm. uh, which was uh, stating, does anybody care about high prices? Right. Because, you know, with everything going on, all the, ne- you know, the negotiations with the, the, with the uh, automobile union and everything mm. else, you know, mm. cars are, people already can't afford vehicles. In and, fact, it's the most expensive time ever to buy a car yeah. right now. And it's going to go way up if the yeah. labor costs go up. Yep. And it's going to go way up if they can't make a profit on it. Mm-hmm. And it's, I mean, it's just, and it's like, does anybody care about the prices that people pay? And that's the interesting thing is everything that you look at, and this has been a big worry since we've been in, infl- in inflation, because unfortunately I am old enough to remember the last time we went through almost a decade of inflation and what it took to get us out of it and i sit back and i go are we headed there again yeah right that's my i i think quite possibly We, there's so many audio cuts from uh, yesterday, so we're going to cover all the topics and then get back to some of the audio from uh, Merrick Garland mm. uh, uh, yesterday. Because it's you you understand why now, why the Republicans are going to go full bore with the uh, impeachment inquiry. Oh, and I did see another article talking about the polling on it saying, well, you know, it's automatically because the Republicans are doing this, there's going to be a negative to it. And the point was made that, impeachment is now normal yeah right that it's not a people don't view it as a radical thing anymore yeah they don't it is it, not it is not the newsmaker right kind of uh massive element huge bomb dropping bombshell kind of thing it was back uh with nixon yeah. and more people are in favor of the impeachment inquiry than are against it hmm they pointed out in, in the polling, and they said the reason, yeah. one of the reasons is, as you and I said, the Democrats took all the seriousness out of impeachment. Right. Yeah. The public doesn't look at it now as this impeachment. Remember, because impeachment would be, this will be the destruction of the president. Right? Right. Nah. Well, and that's, when, you know, with, the, with the, the Trump, it became a badge of honor. Well, that's what changed. What changed was after the the Russian hoax thing. Remember, then Speaker Pelosi kept saying, and she said it for about nine or ten months, no impeachment, no impeachment, no impeachment, no impeachment. All of a sudden, the phone call with Trump and the then incoming president of Ukraine, CIA officer, runs over to Adam Schiff's office, and it wasn't long before, oh, yeah, there's going to be an impeachment. And then you look at it, and it, it, the breakdown of it, because you you have to separate the simple to understand what what people, and, and I don't mean that that people are stupid. It's just what they pay attention to, what catches their eye. The stuff that's easily absorbed and the stuff that gets more complicated. The Russian hoax thing is complicated, and that's because Hillary Clinton is highly complicated as an individual, as is her husband. We say Clinton-esque, and when we say that, that's not a compliment. There was a there was so much in that tangled web going on, and she knew how to design it. Because what do you do? You confuse people. And then even with the media, the play on the media, look, they take it to the FBI and then they leapfrog around in the whole Russian hoax thing, uh, uh, Hillary's team, and go to the media and go, hey, look, the FBI's looking into something. Look over here. And they created it. And they were the ones that created it and took it to the FBI. And and then you look at things like the, the, the Trump impeachments, but especially with the phone call. Because when people do get curious, the ones who don't aren't the walks, but they pay attention, you know, and then then they get curious and they say, well, wait a minute. What what was this all about? What was the phone call about? 
And then you think, oh, well, wait a minute. Well, only the, the liberals were saying, see, he can't do this to somebody who is an opponent. Trump can't do this. He can't get away with this. He can't get away with this. Oh, man, how times have changed. Well, and but we had questioned it because we knew, because the reports were already out there about the Obama State Department really concerned about the uh, the uh, illusion. <laughs> yeah. At the minimum, right. uh, the the. Uh, you know, the the fact that Hunter Biden was working for Burisma and his father had said what he said. And then we had found out the emails of those people inside the State Department that that said it looked terrible of what Biden was saying and that Hunter was working. And but the media ignored that. Right. But you think about it, I mean, the whole thing of the first impeachment based on election interference and. You know, he's going after Biden, who has done nothing wrong. And now everything, for example, yesterday was focused on the fact of when when you think about it, the uh, uh, the statute of limitations running out on the tax charges. That would bring that would bring Joe Biden right into the middle of the whole Burisma thing. And, you know, the uh, the the influence peddling of the whole Burisma and yeah. the prosecutor right. and everything else. And that's the one that they allowed the uh, statute of limitations to run out on those tax charges of, of evading taxes with the Burisma money, because that leads right to Joe Biden. Right. If you're somebody and we'll play the audio cut here in just a second. But if you're somebody who is, again, not a partisan on the left. It's extremely interesting. It's extremely intriguing if you have an investigator mind. So Trump was impeached hmm. for saying that uh, that the that uh, Zelensky coming into uh, Ukraine needed to look at the possible corruption of Joe Biden and Hunter Biden, which was already known. It was yeah. already out there. Right. You, and he can't, you know, he can't do that. That's election interference. Impeach this guy. And now everything that's being hidden right now, the statute of limitations running out on those tax, where everyone knows there isn't anyone out there, any Democrat listening knows that the IRS, if they have you on tax evasion, is not going to let the statute of limitations run out. Yep. They're not going to let that happen. We all know that. If you evade taxes, you're going to pay. Everyone knows. I mean, that is that is as certain as death and taxes well i mean i was about to say it's it is why it's where that that came up you know that how they came up with that there are two things that are certain death and tax. you're gonna pay right you're gonna you're you're going to pay and if you evade taxes and you have a pattern of evading taxes you'll do serious jail time yep and they'll go after hollywood actors yep they don't care. The IRS will get. And so for this to be dropped, and then it's dropped, and then the IRS whistleblowers come forward <laughs> from inside it. And if you're the average American who isn't a partisan, you're going, this stinks to high heavens, which is exactly what all the polls show. Yep. Well, the, uh, Jim Jordan gets uh, into this with Merrick Garland can, uh, uh, on this exact point. Hmm. Here we go. He does not recognize himself. Quote, Mr. Weiss has full authority to bring cases in other jurisdictions if he feels it's necessary. That was your response, Attorney General, to Senator Grassley's question on March 1st, 2023. You just referenced it when Mr. Bishop was questioning you. Only problem is he'd already been turned down by the U.S. Attorney in the District of Columbia, Mr. Graves. So he didn't have full authority, did he? I had an extended conversation with uh, Senator Grassley at the time. We briefly touched on the Section 515 question and how that process went. Um, I have never been suggested. My point's real simple, Mr. Garland. You said he had complete authority, but he'd already been turned down. He He wanted to bring an action in the District of Columbia, and the U.S. attorney there said, no, you can't. And then you go tell the United States Senate under oath that he has complete authority. I'm going to say again that uh, no one had the authority to turn him down. They could refuse uh, to partner with him, they could you not. You can use whatever you, you, language. They, refuse to partner is turning down. Well, it's not the same under a well-known Justice Department practice. Here's why the statute of limitations question is important, and Mr. Bishop was getting at just a few minutes ago. 
Here's why it's important. You let the statute of limitations lapse for 2014, 2015. Those were the years with the felony tax charges where Hunter Biden was getting uh, income from Burisma. Here are four facts that I think are so important. Hunter Biden was put on the board of Burisma, made a lot of money, got paid a lot of money over those years, a couple million bucks. He wasn't qualified. Fact number two, he wasn't qualified to be on the board of Burisma. Not my words, his words. He said he got on the board because of his last name. The brand, as Devin Archer said, when he was under oath and we deposed him. Fact number three, Burisma executives told Hunter Biden, we're under pressure, we need help. Fact number four, Joe Biden goes to Ukraine, leverages our tax money, American people's tax money, to get the prosecutor fired who was applying the pressure. Interestingly enough, that fact is entirely consistent with what the confidential human source told the FBI and they recorded in the 1023 form. The same form Mr. Ray didn't want to let this committee and the Congress see. That all happened. That all happened. And what I'm wondering is why you guys let the statute of limitations lapse for those tax years that dealt with Burisma income. There's one more fact that's important, and that is that this investigation was being conducted by Mr. Weiss, an appointee of President Trump. You will, at the appropriate time, have the opportunity to ask Mr. Weiss that question, and he will no doubt address it in the public report that will be transmitted to the Congress. That's the point right there where Tur- I think that's yep. Turley, Jonathan yep. Turley That's nuts. it. Because what he's saying is, we'll answer your question in three or four years. Well, that's it. Uh, yeah. Um, if you'll just make a note for your grandchildren uh, of, of all the questions that they should ask when the report comes out. This is why we didn't want a special counsel. This is why. And you know how you know he's being political? There's no reason for him as a law enforcement person to bring up the fact that Weiss was appointed by Trump. Right. Because yeah, there's a exactly. ton of there's a ton of people out there. Right. You know, James Comey and mm-hmm. Trump allowed him to stay mm-hmm. when we told him mm-hmm. he should fire. Right. He should fire. And, I don't and, care who and, appointed who. Yeah. It doesn't matter who appointed. And that's how you know it's political. That's how you know that Merrick Garland is playing games. Because how many times yesterday did he say Weiss, who was appointed by Donald Trump? Well, we know there's a ton of people inside of Trump's administration that tried to get him out. Right. That worked against him all the time, whether they were appointed by him or not. It didn't matter. And so that's how you know right there that he's playing politics. It's not about justice to Merrick Garland. It's not about proper law enforcement. It's about politics. I I would like, I'm, uh, where's Kevin Tolbert? From Newsbusters. Kevin, go listen to the whole four hours and see how many times he references uh, Weiss was appointed uh, by by Donald Trump. Because he's trying to make a political point that Mr. Weiss uh, is beyond reproach because Trump appointed him and therefore he would somehow favor Trump. Everyone knows that's not true. Somebody should confront him i don't know if they did yesterday but somebody should confront him on that on the like search I, in, like i just did there okay on the search in the transcript it comes up the word appointed comes up and and trump is is uh, it's one two i can actually search it uh half a dozen times uh and i don't know that this is the complete transcript i got to go and see if this is uh if this is the entire transcript but okay. just in what i have because it doesn't seem like long enough to be uh the entire transcript but i'll, we'll I'll have, double check we'll that. have well more of this coming up too because i want to i want to complete uh what was being said between him and jordan 866 red eye get in touch with red eye radio toll free at 866 90 red eye In Trot Out Radio, he is Eric Harley, and I'm Gary McNamara. We'll get uh, to uh, more of uh, 
<laughs> the Merrick Garland back and forth uh, yesterday. By the way, it was a lot more than six. <laughs> oh, I'm going I, through other enough. parts of the uh, of the transcript. And I found like eleven more. <laughs> oh yeah, he he said it consistently. He said it, uh, I think, three or four times during uh, one back and forth with yeah. one of the representatives. Yeah. And so that's how you know he's playing politics. Uh, uh, I think it was McClintock. I think. Oh, okay. Well, I was board. gonna I was gonna play the McClint- McClintock too. And plus, Jonathan Turley commented on it uh, yesterday. Yeah. yeah. Also, yeah. I believe it was on Fox. I think he commented mm-hmm. on it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but uh, that's how you know because if you're in law enforcement, it doesn't matter who appointed anybody. You're simply saying he's following the law enforcement processes. Yeah. You know the law enforcement process. Here are the standards that we have, and this is what he followed. You don't bring in who appointed him. doesn't matter who appointed him. It's is he doing his job. That's how you know. That's the key that you know that Merrick Garland is a political hack. Yep. Tell me where I'm wrong. Right. There's no reason to bring that that up, especially there's no reason to bring it up with Donald Trump. It really doesn't have any credibility because we know that people that Trump may have appointed or allowed to stay in, for example, like Comey, worked against him on a consistent basis. In fact, uh, was it was it Comey who said that, uh, that uh, for example, uh, with, uh, what's his name? Oh, the guy that they went after. Remember we, he, that he said we went in and asked him, we went in and, and interviewed him, didn't follow proper protocol. Michael Flynn. Michael Flynn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, the Michael Flynn interview we, that, they, the mm-hmm. incoming administration was very green. They were new to all this. And essentially, they didn't know that the proper protocol would have been to approach White House counsel first. Right. And so they didn't do it. Comey was bragging about that. In testimony. I mean, it's just insane. The arrogance that runs through these people. This is Red Eye Radio on Westwood. Now, it's Red Eye Radio. Gary McNamara and Eric Harley talk about everything from politics to social issues and news of the day. Whether you're up late or you're just starting your day, welcome to the show from the Uniden America Studios. This is is Red Eye Radio. All across America and around the world, we are Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Harley and I'm Gary McNamara. Good morning. Thank you for being here. (laughs) I just saw this story. Where is this? Fox Business, I think, had this story. Mm. A customer at a Vietnamese restaurant in California was forced to pay an 18% gratuity charge under a restaurant policy that requires a surcharge for any tables with parties of one or larger. <laughs> Aren't all parties party of one <laughs> or larger? <laughs> uh, a photo of the receipt uh, taken from the uh, restaurant was posted online. Uh, <laughs> mildly infuriating. Many people reading the thread showing the policy. It reads, 18% service charge included for parties of one or larger. (laughs) And 18% gratuity is applied automatically. If you have any questions, speak to the manager. (laughs) Is it it not the mandatory, is it not the mandatory 18% gratuity, but the parties of one or larger? (laughs) Irritates people. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if you're going to do that, they're you know they're basically saying everybody pays mandatory eighteen percent tip. You know, it's a, a lot of people get frustrated when it's a larger you know a larger party. I don't know 
it depends on the restaurant. And then they'll put up their, you know, uh, parties of, I don't know, eight or more, ten or more, automatic gratuity added to the, added to your bill. And I, you know, as long as they're letting you know ahead of time, and that's kind of a special circumstance, if you're bringing 10 people in, my crew, with all my kids and grandkids, we're 16 people. That's a large party. Mm -hmm. It's a large bill every time. And I pay a minimum of 20. It's usually 22 or 25. I just, I just talked to somebody yesterday who said, you know, it's getting so expensive to eat out where I just really don't leave a large tip anymore. doesn't matter whether the service is good. I just don't leave, leave a large tip. And I'm like, well, that's why you're going to get this. Well, no, I mean, that's the problem is right. that, you know, because the restaurants aren't going to, you know, all of a sudden start paying people uh, $25 an hour. It's not that's not going to work that way. They work for their tips. And if you're if you're serving my crew. You're going to be you're going to be working. You're going to be dedicated to that. Now, I can't remember the last time all 16 of us sat down at a table. Um, it's been a while. Typically, now, when we get together, we cook if we're, because there's just uh, you can't visit with everybody. The table is so huge, you know, unless we had our own room, a party room at the restaurant or something, you know, so we'll either get stuff and bring it to the house or we'll cook. But if it's a, you know, I tip, I tip, well, I tip, uh, I can't remember the last time I tipped only 20%. It's usually 22 or 25%, especially right now, because my thought is I want that restaurant to be open. And it's usually, if I go out to eat, it's a restaurant I go to, you know, um, on a regular basis. It's one I would normally choose. And that's all relative because I don't eat out a lot just because of my schedule. Yeah, I hardly ever eat out, but the places I do eat out at, I I know the people there. I mm-hmm. like that's it. being, I like the experience of being there. So uh, I tip well. And one of the reasons I've always tipped well is I worked in the service industry. Mm-hmm. Now, I didn't actually service, but I worked in the service industry with people who made their living through tips. My, um, so it's just it's a natural. I don't even think about it because I've been doing it for there's a oh, there's a fifty two, years. Two or three <laughs> restaurants. Uh, there's one right near our house uh, where they know my wife. She'll bring friends and business associates to these these handful of restaurants that that we go to. She goes to because she has business and and she'll you know take people there. But we'll often be sitting there and someone else who's not even our server will come over and say hi. Mm-hmm. And those are the that's the kind of environment that's the experience I want is that you know there's that clear understanding you know you want the food to be good that's number one you want the service to be good that's right up there with the food but beyond that you want a nice environment you want the people to be friendly and I also want those establishments to be around you know I want them to be successful and so if I start pulling back, my thought is I can either afford to go out or just not go out. If I can't afford to go out, and there, there are a lot of people, you know, you know, in that situation where, okay, I'm not going to, you know, right now I'm going to cut back on doing that. There's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, if you're going to go out, these are servers that, I mean, they're, they're living is based on this. Mm-hmm. And a lot of them are working a second job. A lot of them are working multiple restaurants so they're working in several locations maybe either for the same company or similar type restaurants in order to make things work like you and it's easier to do it it's easier to 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 tip well when you have a number of restaurants that you go to and have gone to for a while and so you know the experience and you really like the experience of going in Mm -hmm. it's not just very rarely um, I, I mean, it's just very rarely do I go to a new place. Mm-hmm. I really don't. I don't. It's not like, okay, we're all going to head to this place. Not that it doesn't happen, but that's a very rare occurrence. The majority of places, I, and I'm thinking of the three places that I 
that I really uh, go to. One is a uh, is a uh, 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 an exotic, as I call it, an exotic brewery with the best barbecue on the planet, mm-hmm. uh, and very very personalized service. You know, you walk in, everybody knows your name. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just you know, it's the the people there, and uh, and and so um, uh, the other place is a. Uh, a coffee place that serves food. Another one is a breakfast restaurant Mm -hmm. and all of them. I walk in and you, you walk in, they know who you are. How are you doing? What's going on? Mm -hmm. How is your, you know, how is your family? The serve, the service is great. I go because it's, it's an, I love the food, Mm -hmm. but as much as I love the food, it's the experience of being there. Yeah. Right. And so when you get that, it's much easier to tip when you're in that type of atmosphere Mm -hmm. it's a completely different thing if you just walk into a restaurant and it's like okay here it is and and i and and i thought this probably ticked off people and i'm reading further in this article of this vietnamese restaurant uh that uh, said many users who commented on the uh on it said that they would have walked away from paying the outrageous fee uh with others saying that uh, they had walked away uh from similar situations uh one said and for parties or one or, or larger, what a convoluted way of saying everybody is charged 18%. Yeah, right, yeah. I thought that probably would tick off some people yeah. if they just said 18% service charge for everything. Right. Well, then you can figure that out in your mind and you can go, is it worth is it worth being here? As long as you know up front, that's what you're going to get. Well, what's unfortunate is that would lower my bill if I were to abide only by that 18%. And in my case, it would too. Yeah. You know, and yes. and the point being not really about me, but a lot of people are mm-hmm. in that boat. Now, if I get great service, I'm going to tip more either way. You know, I mean, that's just the way, oh. that's just the way I, I, I believe. But, but many people will look at it and say, well, I would have tipped 22, but since you're going to have this policy, I'm only going to tip 18. Now, across the board, it still could mean more for those servers there. But the question is, how will it impact business if fewer people are coming in as a result of the policy? Then you're going to have fewer dollars coming in to those servers. You know, the thing is, I've, you know, I've, and I've, I've lived in a lot of tourist towns in, in my life, and there's a difference between a server and a professional server. Mm-hmm. And we've all, we've all dealt with that. Mm-hmm. There's a service. Yeah. How are you? Well, what do you want? And there's a server that when you walk in, you feel like you're home, mm-hmm. you know, and they're just, they're just, they're, they're pr- the true professional servers uh, out there. And, yeah, after that, the experience with it, where they make you feel so welcome and at home, you're going to reward them. Mm-hmm. That's my natural instinct to do it. You know, I, I will I will say that probably working in the service industry for a while, and that's when I was a club DJ, mm-hmm. but I worked at places, you know, and everybody was, you know, except for me, really was getting tips. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so um, that's, you know, I just, I saw the complaints, but I still think that I would, I say that because I worked in the service industry, but I think that just naturally, if I believe understanding what the product is, understanding that the product just isn't the food, right? Understanding the product is part of the atmosphere. And when you walk in and you realize I had a great experience here, you just naturally go, all right. In my mind, I go, that was worth this. If I go into a new place and the experience starts out bad, I will leave before it gets going. I'll get up and go. Yeah, so, I, I, yeah, it's a I great don't, point. So you know, I, I, I just, yeah. I've done it only a handful of times, relatively speaking, but I will. Uh, it happened at one new restaurant in our neighborhood. Went in, we sat down. There was only three of us, actually. We were at this bistro-type table, and the server just kind of waved and said, uh, just a minute. I thought, Okay. They weren't tremendously busy, and it was a Saturday evening. That was kind of a first red flag. But then the server was engaged in a conversation with someone else, and it wasn't about business. It wasn't their another employee. It was just somebody that was there, and they were talking about it. And I could overhear it because they were pretty loud. And it went on for a few minutes, and I thought, well, 
okay, then I guess business isn't a priority. Let's go. And I got up and I left. And I'll continue to do that if it if it is a situation that isn't going to suit my liking, you know, and that's just that's just the no, type you, of person I am. You you sense before the before you even yeah. get you sense I'm not going to walk out on yeah. a bill. I'm not going right. to I'm not going to just say, but, "Well, this was so bad, I'm just not going to pay." I'm not going to let it go that far. Exactly. When you sense a situation isn't going the way that you want, yep. you're not going to get yep. the service you want. It's like We're not out we're, to a good we're, start. We're going somewhere else. Yep. I mean, and and you know, you for for example, I'm heading to uh, New York this weekend and the United Nations is meeting there, so they're bringing in all the high class hookers. Oh, and yeah. And so yeah. I, you know, I plan on, you know, I plan on, you know, tipping really nice, you yeah, know, right. for for, uh, for that. You know, just by the hour, by the, you know, whatever it takes. Did you see that story? Was that in the New York Post? The one about the the convention? Yeah. The hooker convention? Yeah. yeah. They're all coming. They're all from, coming in. What they say from Nevada and where? But, Somewhere else. Yeah, but they're all coming in because of the UN people there. Oh, is that is it? It's that's because what, of the that's UN what I got. people. That's that's what. Okay, that's what I got out of it. I'm like, oh, well, so everybody. I going thought to... they were having their own convention. Oh, maybe it is both. Well, because they rented the convention center by the hour. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, maybe, I'm just maybe. joking. It was... <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a joke. I thought they were having their own. Co- I oh, may have okay. misread it. I didn't spend uh, okay. a lot of time on that neither story. Did, neither did I. I yeah, I, because I, number one, yeah. you, and number two. <laughs> Seriously, there's not a seriously, there's not enough Lysol on the planet. <laughs> there just isn't. Ugh. I know. It's yeah. Like it's, don't you love it when they say, Ugh. but these are high class? Yeah, right. It's like, oh, man, stop it. Yeah. Come on. Right. Oh, I'll, I'll bring some high class oh. Lysol. Don't, don't. <laughs> How's that? I'll bring, don't. I'll bring that extra for Breeze. <laughs> <laughs> well, I justified it that uh, you know, I, I would justify it that I'm in an open marriage from yesterday, <laughs> from yesterday's show. You have to be listening yeah. to yesterday's show yeah. to understand that. <laughs> and by that, he means single. Single, exactly. <laughs> I, I'm in an open marriage. I'm single. <laughs> open non-marriage. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, I took from I took from what little I read that that was that was. Oh, okay. Their, Maybe it was a convention near it, but I. I Pick, that's what I because or maybe they decided to have their own convention at the same time the U N. But you know the funniest, <laughs> you know the funniest thing is when you said I didn't spend a lot of time on the article. Neither do I. It's it just how was, how we yeah. how we both scan the news. You sit there right. and you go, okay, hooker, okay, hookers, U N. What is it here? Uh, okay, I've heard enough. I, yeah, and I'll go like maybe a couple senses. Okay, it's amazing how it's like I don't have time for that. Let me get. I need something. I need something more of substance. I don't spend and a lot a of time. Con- hooker with, convention. Uh, there are two things I don't spend a lot of time doing, uh, uh, reading about uh, hookers and the UN. UN. <laughs> Both are prostituting themselves. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> I mean you know, it, it fits, though. It does, it huh? does fit. No doubt. <laughs> Boy, that, wow. You know, we talk about BS in our society. That really is BS, isn't it? Yeah. High class. Yeah. Oh, see, no, these, these yeah, no, no, yeah, right, okay, all right, fine, Ew. yeah, <laughs> ew. ew. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Eight six six ninety red eye. Get in touch with Red Eye Radio, toll free at eight six six ninety red eye. It's Friday Radio. He's Eric Carly, and I'm Gary McNamara. So uh, it it was because of the UN. We just yeah we, yeah we, we read the story yeah, because yeah. the UN's coming in. So right. there's so many hookers that are coming in from around the country for the UN diplomats who will be trying to bring peace to the world and and well, and, and stop uh, high end, high priced, high end right to bring, hookers to bring. Peace to the world yeah. and stop slavery. Right. Yeah. And going to prostitutes yeah. at night. Right. Yeah. So 
Right. Uh, those kind of prices, you'll have to sell your Boutros, your Boutros, and your Golly. <laughs> this. <laughs> All right, very quickly. And, and by the way, on a, on a serious note, uh, how is that not supporting human trafficking? Exactly, yeah. I mean, that's... Exactly. I, I know. I mean, it just, I, it's, it's just, just amazing. I mean, and, just, and then, right. of course, during the day, oh, well, no, we want to get together and discuss world peace and, and the problem with human trafficking. Yeah, what are you doing after five? You know? I'm laughing at the hypocrisy. Yeah, not, and I exactly. Want to make, make no, sure I mean, here. it's because... No, I know, I know. And I, I would... Know. By the way, any investigative reporters... There's something you could look into. Well, who knows? They may be part of it. Partaking could, could, in the could festivities. Be. Could be. Very very quickly, true story here. I can tell it within a minute. Hmm. I was on the radio one day this, doing my local show, and a guy called me up, and this was something about uh, the, the it was something the UN, I forgot what it was, probably Arab or Israeli something. This goes back about I mean, 20 years ago. I'm on the air. A guy calls me. He goes, I know more about the UN than you do. And, you know, the history of the U.N. And I go, do you really? And he said, yeah, yeah. And so this was like 2004, maybe 2003. Mm. So Boutros Ghali was already secretary general. So mm-hmm. I got into a discussion with him saying, well, let's talk about Boutros, Boutros Ghali and what he did here. Do you think that he was good at doing? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, what about Utant? You know, Utant when he was in. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. He did a real great job. But what do you disagree here or whatever? And I said, okay, what about uh, Jar Jar Banks? Mm-hmm. And and I said, I think Jar Jar Binks was the best U.N., you know, secretary ever for nah. what he did for, you know, what he did for world peace. The guy goes, I agree with you. I really, truly agree with you. And I said, well, you know something? You are right. You do know as much as I do about the United yeah. Nations. Thanks so much. Never broke. Never broke the ice. Never, never, broke, never broke the broke ice. The, yeah. when it went into a commercial break. My phones went crazy. Yeah. I mean, the people went, oh, my God, you totally conned that guy. Hilarious. Jar Jar Binks is a character from Star Wars. Giving you 70% each night. Eric Harley and Gary McNamara on Red Eye Radio. It's Red Eye Radio. He's Eric Carley, and I'm Gary McNamara. One of the things we're doing, we're covering all the different stories uh, uh, out there and at the same time trying to get through as much audio as we can from the Merrick Garland testimony uh, uh, yesterday. This is more uh, from uh, Jim Jordan going back and forth, and this has to do with the statute of limitations, and this has to do with the uh, the felony counts of, uh, on the, uh, the, uh, the, the tax, evading taxes the felony counts that they just let lapse. And here's part of that back and forth. The lawyers just like let it, they just like, oh, darn, we let it. Were they careless? I expect that won't be what he says, but uh, because I promise. You know that's not the case. Because as Mr. Bishop pointed out, they had a tolling agreement. They had, they talked to Hunter Biden's defense counsel and say, let's extend the statute of limitations. And then at some point they made an intentional decision to say, we're going to let the statute of limitations lapse. And I want to know, who decided that and why they did it? Mr. Weiss was a supervisor of the investigation at that time and at all times. He made the necess- appropriate decisions, and you'll be able to ask him that question, and he will. You know why they did it. Everyone knows why they did it. You may not say it, but everyone knows why they did it. They did the Baris- those tax years. That's that that dealt with the pre- that involved the president. It's one thing to have a gun charge in Delaware. That doesn't involve the president of the United States. But Burisma, oh my, that goes right to the White House. We can't have that. And we can slow walk this thing along. We can even extend the statute of limitations, and then we can intentionally let it lapse. And we know this investigation was slow. Here's what everyone said. Shapley said, DOJ slow walked the investigation. Ziegler, slow walking in the approvals of everything. This happened at the Delaware's attorney's office and DOJ tax level. Mr. Sobosinski, the FBI agent, said, I would have liked to th- see things move faster. Ms. Holly said the same. Every witness we've talked to said this thing was slow walked, and we know why. They slow walked it long enough to let the statute of limitations run so they wouldn't have to get into Burisma. Tell me where I'm wrong. 
Will the gentleman think, yield? No, I'm asking the, no. uh, Mr. Garland the question. I think I've tried to make clear that I don't know the specifics of the investigation. Much of what you are describing occurred uh, during the Trump administration, during a uh, Justice Department appointed by President Trump. No, it didn't. This is four and a half years of this investigation. We're talking about the last few years. Your statement was just this year, March 1st, to, to Senator Grassley. No, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I was trying to respond to your descriptions of what the uh, IRS um, um, uh, agent said about the certain statute things. statute of limitations is six years. That lapsed. That lapsed here in, in, the, in the Biden on the, administration. On the statute of limitations, I um, will say again that the explanation for why the statute of limitation was lapsed, if it was, has to come from... If it was. Yeah. We know it was. He's basically right. claiming he doesn't even know what the hell's in the damn news. Right. If this Hunter Biden person actually exists. Yes. I mean, it's just... Now, the interesting thing <laughs> the, the interesting thing is I'm, I'm going to go to Jonathan Turley's analysis on that uh, he had on Fox News yesterday because this is really, really interesting because, uh, uh, you know, he keeps referring to Weiss. Remember, the Republicans were going to call Weiss to testify. And what what uh, uh, Garland is saying is you're going to find it all out when Weiss uh, has his report at the end of this investigation, which means Weiss isn't going to testify. They wanted Weiss to testify in Congress in the next couple of months. And what Garland's telling them is the guy who's at the center of this, that all the whistleblowers are stating he said he did not have control of it. Mm -hmm. They cannot get to testify under oath because he made him a special counsel. And so it's the big block. And here's where they talk about this on Fox News uh, yesterday. Turley first asked, because this was halfway through Mm. uh, when they took a break and, and Turley was on Fox News, asked what he thought of what was going on so far. Well, it's what we expected. First of all, the substance of his answers uh, really doesn't exceed what you'd find in a Hallmark greeting card, right? It's just basically reciting the same line that we expected, uh, that this is all given to special counsel Wise. There was one thing that I took note of, mm-hmm. and that is when he was asked whether, you know, when, when would these answers be forthcoming, he said they will all be forthcoming from Weiss. And then he added when he submits his report to Congress. Now, that is significant because usually a special counsel will not submit the report until largely at the end of the investigation. Mm-hmm. Uh, that would likely be after the election. It certainly could would run beyond the impeachment inquiry. Uh, that's quite a significant statement if that's what he intended, because Weiss was scheduled to go before the House to answer questions. And it was right before that occurred that Garland made him special counsel. Mm. And many of us said that the impact of that could be that it insulates Weiss from having to answer these questions. The, the statement that he just made would suggest, unless he changes it in, in later questions, that he intends to answer questions much, much later uh, in the form of the final report given to Congress. So how would you describe that in terms of what Republicans are trying to do? Is that the ultimate block mechanism? Is it something else? This is going to get... Uh, very serious very quickly because this is not just an oversight question. Mm -hmm. You now have an impeachment inquiry uh, in the field. Part of that inquiry is whether there was an abuse of power, an abuse of office, uh, whether there was influence that benefited uh, the president's son. Um, If the attorney general is saying we're not going to answer any questions until the issuance of a final report by the special counsel, That's not going to satisfy Congress. They have to get answers as part of their impeachment inquiry. So this is going to set up a heck of a confrontation if that is indeed the intended meaning that uh, that answer had for the attorney general. Now, I want to make it clear. It is what he intended because he said it multiple times. Mm -hmm. He didn't say it once. He said it multiple times. And the the thing is, too, here, what what you have, this isn't this isn't about the the. Uh, about, uh, uh, you know, the this isn't just about Hunter Biden and Joe Biden. It's also about the corruption of the Department of Justice. 
Yeah. You know, you've, right. we've, we've got the weaponization, which is obvious, the weaponization that's going on. Uh, in, he, was, uh, he was pounded on uh, about uh, going after Catholics uh, yesterday and mm. couldn't have any, you know, really didn't have any answers for that uh, uh, either. Just said it was horrible and just, and then he was asked, well, do you believe that, uh, you know, Catholics are radicals? And, of course, he wouldn't answer the question. He goes, well, your Department of Justice did. Yeah. Well, right. And we were upset. Yeah, but remember we were told it was only one right. place, and it wasn't. It was more right. than than one place. And he said, anybody disciplined for this yet? And, you know, can't answer any questions on that either. They can't answer. He can't answer any questions. And the problem with that is, is the, the, the guilt, the, the, uh, excuse me, not the guilt, but the accusation of corruption is not just the Biden family, including Joe Biden. The allegations of corruption, not yeah. made by the Republicans, right. but made by the whistleblowers, right. is Weiss, who was going to testify, who now basically has immunity from testifying because they made him a special counsel, and we can't find the reason that they made him a special counsel. There is no, there is no line of logic saying we made him a special counsel because of this. They just made him the special counsel when he was supposed to conveniently made him the special counsel when he was supposed to testify very soon before Congress, and now the Department of Justice is making the case. He's not going to testify before Congress until it's all over, which could be years down the road. Right. Everything, everything doesn't pass the stink test. Well, and and that's what it comes down to is that if you're paying attention, if you just stand back and listen to the content of these answers and all of the answers yesterday that were being repeated over and over again, what you see is this arrogance and this defiance. We're going to run this show the way we want to run it. You can ask us all the questions you want to, and we'll dance around those questions. You may think you have oversight, but we're the Department of Justice. One of the things that we had said in, you know, with Garland's testimony uh, before is the bluntness of to hell with you, yeah. uh, citizens of the United States. Mm-hmm. We'll do what we want. Yep. We will have a two tier system of justice. We'll be blunt and promote it. Yep. We'll obviously do things that are absolutely against it, would get any other law enforcement person probably fired mm-hmm. at any other level. Mm-hmm. We won't answer questions on obvious huge problems and and that's and and the 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 problem is the arrogance continues on things like and it did yesterday on things like the felony evasion charges yeah well i don't know anything about it he's trying to make the case i didn't even and he made it right at the end again he doesn't even know whether that happened right it's all in the news he doesn't even know whether the statute of limitations has run out on those charges. Right. The the biggest thing that they're prosecuting or they're looking into and investigating, and he doesn't even know what's doesn't in the news. Know. He's attempting to sell that to the American people. And he has to do that because the American people aren't going to buy the fact that it just was an accident or that it's commonplace to drop felony tax felony tax evasion charges. To people, everyone knows that doesn't happen. And we covered that earlier where, you know, uh, there's two things you can be sure in life, death and taxes. And Mm -hmm. if you don't pay uh, your taxes, if you don't pay your taxes, uh, you know, you'll be in problems. But if you evade taxes, you're going to jail. Oh, yeah. And everybody knows you're going to jail if you evade your taxes, if you purposely evade it and they just let it out and they had an agreement. Here's the point they're trying to make in case people don't understand it. They had an agreement with the defense attorneys and were discussing, all right, you know, if you don't want us to charge now, we'll extend out. Will you agree to extend out 
the statute of uh, of limitations, and they never got to a conclusion on that because they just let it go. Yeah, they, they just they, they basically just, just, let, they it just let it go. And does anybody believe? Because nobody's making the case inside the federal government. The prosecutors never made the case that there weren't felony charges. Right. That's why that thing, you know, that the whole thing got kicked out by the judge, you know, uh, and, and everything. Else. But, uh, you know, that but, you know, the the other charges. Right. But on the right. felony charges with Burisma that would lead right to the White House, they nobody's ever made the case in the Department of Justice that, well, this didn't happen because because um, that case is over. You mm-hmm. can answer those mm-hmm. questions. Mm-hmm. That case is over. It's not being investigated right now. That person may be in being investigated, but he's not being investigated it's for not those for things. This. Right. Because that that's done. Why can't you answer something that legally is done? Because they know they can't sell it to the American public. Right. And by the way, somebody should ask that question the way I just asked it right there. They might have yesterday. I didn't get to watch the entire thing. But mm-hmm. I didn't see where that was answer, asked and or answered. And you think that if it was, it would have been something that would be prime time in the news. Right. In the conservative news media. Well, this is, you know, and, and the stalling on the, well, if the statute of limitations did expire, yeah. what he's saying is I'm still not going to talk about it. Yeah. He's trying to make the case that I can't talk about it because I'm unsure if it did expire. Yeah. And he's lying. And he's lying. Point. He's lying. He knows Everybody that. knows it. I know it. And you if, know he, it. <laughs> if he acknowledged that he did, then you can talk about it openly. Yeah. Because there's nothing to prosecute. You can't. The law says you can't. But he won't because, well, we're not quite sure. I'm just a caveman attorney general. <laughs> I don't know of your modern limitations and whatnot. Uh, I'm not familiar with your modern media that covers <laughs> yeah, things. Exactly. And, I. And, what do you call it? A television? Uh, yes. Is you that mean, some sort of transportation module? The, I don't know of these modern ways. Yeah. Caveman attorney general. Yeah, I don't know anything. I don't not know even it. what's in the news. You, you'd have to ask somebody else. I'm not in charge. Eight six six ninety Red Eye. Lines open for your calls. Eight six six ninety Red Eye on Red Eye Radio. It's Red Eye Radio. He's Eric Carley, and I'm Gary McNamara. And coming up, uh, you know, uh, another story about another IRS uh, official frustrated with the Department of Justice for not uh, bringing charges against Hunter Biden. We'll get uh, to that. This story, Hollywood studio and writers near agreement to end strike. Hope to finalize a deal today. I guess we'll see, right? Yeah. is Red Eye Radio on Westwood One. Now, it's Red Eye Radio. Gary McNamara and Eric Harley talk about everything from politics to social issues and news of the day. Whether you're up late or you're just starting your day, welcome to the show from the Uniden America Studios. This is is Red Eye Radio. And he is Eric Harley, and I am Gary McNamara. Good morning. Thank you for being here. We are already the Thursday. Other things uh, in the news. Oil to $100 a barrel. Is that, what, 91? Uh, Right Uh, now it's at... 89, 89, but over okay. in recent days, it's been uh, hovering right below 91. Yep. Yeah. Uh, John Carney, who I've seen many times on uh, on, on Bloomberg and, mm. and other media sources, uh, mm. is uh, Breitbart. 
uh, economic uh, uh, editor, uh, did an interview yesterday where he said oil is definitely going uh, to $100 a uh, barrel. And here is part of the interview that he did uh, yesterday. Uh, here it is. Well, I think oil is definitely going to reach $100 a barrel, and I don't see a reason why it's going to come down. The Biden administration really messed up by releasing so much from the strategic reserves. Right now, they have nothing left. They, you know, they fired all the bullets, more or less. And so there's not a source of oil that can be released into the market to bring down prices. The Saudis and the Russians want oil up near $100, and that's where it's going to go. Well, I I do think that the uh, energy production has a lot to do with it. Right now, the U.S. is actually producing a lot of energy. We could be producing a lot more. But the U.K., frankly, has intentionally crippled itself, basically took a hammer to its own knee, and it cannot produce enough energy. It doesn't have to be dependent. It especially doesn't have to be dependent on Russia. That was a colossal policy failure. We make so much liquefied natural gas in the U.S., we actually could be the supplier to the UK, to all of Europe. We should cement that relationship and make sure that this dependency on Russia never comes back. It, it is very ironic that the West, in the name of environmentalism and you know trying to stop climate change, but not really doing anything about it, really just said, you know what, it's too dirty for us to do over here. We're going to have it done someplace behind the scenes where we don't have to pay that much attention to it. We'll do it over here. We we can produce the energy, even if Europe isn't ready to get on board and produce their own energy. The United States can do it. We just need a president that will allow that to happen. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's all about policy and 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 has been for a long, long time. And, you know, we had been exporting uh, finished product and then the Republican Congress made it possible to. Uh, several years ago to export, start exporting more of the raw crude. And so we can set up trade routes and fill in that gap and have Europe more dependent on the U.S., the friendly U.S., rather than Russia. And he brings up a couple of points. OPEC, of course, they want to keep it high. They want to, you know, turn down their spigot in terms of production in order to keep it at 100 or drive it to $100 a barrel. Uh, I would say, I don't know, between 90 and 100. Um, but there there really isn't anything that's going to bring it off this 90 ridge, I believe. any Anywhere between, you know, 89 $95 a barrel it's likely going to bounce. And some of that is going to have to do with the production from other parts of the world. He also mentioned Russia. Russia would love $100 a barrel. And if you think about it in in the history of oil production globally and the history of prices, the highest was the summer of 2008, $147 a barrel. Well, You know, they understand, OPEC understands, this is their opportunity while they've got an administration in the U.S. that is not oil production friendly. So you take it in while you can, because if a conservative administration or more conservative administration, a pro-oil production administration comes in, kicks some of the mandates down the road, and also has lawmakers on board with helping to establish long-term trade routes with European partners that starts to cut more and more Russia out of the equation then, and, and turn them into a pariah under Putin's leadership, which is exactly what you want in this case, then they understand, OPEC knows, we've got to do this now. We've got to, we've got to bank what we can now, and they also understand the threshold because the threshold is you get up above $100 a barrel, you get into 110 you get into 120 if it ever reached that, and then what happens? Well, we start conserving. We start driving less, and then that lower demand is going to drive prices down. You start having a glut on the market, and they don't want that. So they've, they've calculated this, and that's why when everyone was talking about it yesterday, you know, $100 a barrel in this analyst you know, bringing up $100 a barrel, 
Um, it's not surprising because it's not far out of the range of where we are right now. Yes, it would be a 10 percent jump, uh, roughly a little more 11 percent jump than from where we are now, 11, 12 percent jump. But that's not out of that threshold range to the point that consumers would cut back in big, big ways. Keep in mind, airline prices have gone up. Uh, You're going to look at your fall and winter driving seasons, which really is about the holidays, and people are willing to drive uh, at Thanksgiving and Christmas. And flying is way too expensive for most families. So OPEC knows where that threshold is. And they don't want to go beyond that threshold because that starts uh, driving prices down when you have a glut on the market, when you have lower demand. So you keep you keep it priced at where the demand will still be healthy. And OPEC wants to bank this over and over and over again. And it's all absolutely unnecessary. We could change this, but this is what we have voted for. The majority of Americans want this situation. They want open borders. They want high gasoline prices. They want high oil prices. This is what they want. They, it's what they voted for. Yep. You know, they they scream when it happens, yep. but it's like they want to there, complain. There, there's always been this disconnect where, yeah. well, you voted for it. Right. Now you're getting it and you're angry that you got it. You got inflation. Now you got uh, high interest rates and, and it's going to be higher by the end of the year on interest rates. It's the most expensive time to buy a car for all of those reasons and because going, of the EV mandates and also right. because of the financing involved. And it's going to get more expensive when the labor costs go up when this mm-hmm. is eventually uh, when when this uh, strike is eventually settled. And interesting article that it's something that we brought up a couple of times this week. And it's does anybody care about American consumers? Nora Rothman had it mm. and talked about the the, the fact that uh, the word is the Biden administration is torn. Uh, there, on one hand, the United Auto Workers strike is a searing critique of the administration's environmentalist policies and the price instability It has produced, on the other, it's a labor action, and organized labor is beyond criticism. So it's like, well, this is what you created. Right. Uh, You don't, you claim you don't want higher prices, yet the whole environmental thing that we just talked about with EVs and everything else and your, your, your policy on, on energy and, and gas and, and uh, 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 the, the grid and everything else is only going to do one thing, which is increase the cost of energy, which is going to increase inflation and increase inflation more than the marketplace would do so, as we have seen, because anytime you have massive inflation, every single time we've had massive inflation in this nation's history, it's because of government policy. Mm -hmm. You don't have it naturally occurring. And not that it doesn't happen, but not at this particular rate. You're always having inflation, but where you really see the supercharged inflation is when the government gets involved in it. But he talks here about, it's like, does anybody care about the American consumer? And says, okay, now Trump's going to go to Detroit and Trump's going to be talking to the auto workers. And he's making the point that Trump is going to back that the automobile companies need to make the deal with, uh, you know, with the, the, uh, you know, the uh, auto workers because he sees it and the Republican Party sees it as an opportunity to totally transform and have the Republican Party a labor party. Yeah. Well, is that the case? And we said it's going to be very interesting to see what Trump says to these auto workers. Is it just going to be you need to make more money no matter what, including, as we all know, taxpayer dollars to do it? Or is Trump going to say, your leaders caused this, your union leaders caused this, the Democratic Party caused it. We need to get back to, to you know, gasoline vehicles. But that's the question that he's asking here. Is a Repu- what, what direction is the Republican Party? Uh, does anybody care about prices? We care about workers, but do you care about the people that can't afford to buy a car. Well, because you know we can uh, we can use the parallel that uh, or, or compare it to the conversation about oil. At some point, there is that threshold. 
even if you extend out the payments, what what is it, a 30-year mortgage on a small car now? <laughs> even if you extend those payments out to what was it 94 months uh, 96 I, what did we, I think we found 80, i think 80, we found was it 80 something 88 was it something 80 month loans yeah or something like that. and people are because what it comes down to is 84 that, months yeah. It was, yeah what it comes down to is that you you do reach that threshold interest rates are going to cut into it inflation on on uh a number of fronts uh, the the supplies, all of the components for building a car and raw materials, you know, having gone up, uh, the the mandates where they have to raise the price on on the gasoline powered vehicles in order to try and cover some of the losses on the EVs, all of these things equate to a higher right now, the most expensive time to buy a car, and there there will be that threshold, and when that threshold hits. Then that's when you're start. You're going to start seeing if production is uh, dropping. You're going to start seeing layoffs on the line for those same union members. That's just the way it will but, happen. You know, and so you and I look at inf- uh, inflation, and one of my fears from the very beginning, and as I've said before, I'm old enough to remember the inflation of the '70s, which basically lasted a decade because mm-hmm. nobody would actually do anything about it. Right, and you see here. Uh, the government, the Democrats, wish to skyrocket energy prices. Mm -hmm. That's not good because it goes across the board. You see here in this particular, uh, uh, with uh, because the government wishes to make EVs, uh, they can't afford to pay people, so the unions are basically going for the taxpayer subsidy to have incredible salaries for unions. Mm -hmm. Well, that's only going to cause more inflation. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, you look just... And everything, oh, oh, and then the the Fed, for example, isn't going to do anything. But the majority of the Fed, twelve of the nineteen members of the Fed, believe, yeah, we're going to have to raise interest rates again. Well, why not do it now? And the question is, does anybody care actually about the prices in the policies that we are promoting? And whether and where is the Republican Party going to go in twenty twenty four when it comes to it? Now we know that already two of the things that Trump has proposed would raise prices on consumers. Subsidies for ethanol, that all comes from the taxpayer, and his 10% across-the-board tariffs. Mm-hmm. So it's a legitimate question. If Trump wins and is the leader of the Republican Party, do both parties not care about prices that consumers have to pay? Is it only about fitting particular constituents in Trump's case, I need to take care of the farmers with your taxpayer dollars. Now I need to take care of the auto workers with your taxpayer dollars. Mm-hmm. No, and, the, and, and it I will don't, be interesting to see what uh, the conversation is like. Yeah, and in, I don't know. in his talks with the UAW right. next week. Now he may go the opposite direction, which I hope he does. Which says we need to produce gasoline vehicles. Mm-hmm. If he doesn't do it, remember he was all behind Lordstown. He was behind mm-hmm. his kind of electric vehicles, mm-hmm. and they went bottom. You know, they went. You know down the toilet mm-hmm. and and so everybody's been involved in wanting to get elected by using your taxpayer dollars both republicans and democrats democrats to a greater extent but now that republicans are looking to get in and say wow you know we can we may have a chance of getting labor here well how are you going to get labor are you going to get labor by saying we need profitable companies because that's the only chance you have to exist or are we going to do exactly what the Democrats have done and say, okay, we'll put it on the taxpayer? Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I don't know which way they're going. And I hope next week that Trump does the correct thing for America, which is tell the union people that we need to produce gasoline vehicles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I, I guess don't, we'll see where it goes. But I don't know where he's going to go because on ethanol, Taxpayers need to support the ethanol industry, mm-hmm. which nobody is asking for. Mm-hmm. And but then- you know, it's the you know the immediate situation with oil where we are right now is is going to drive things well into the election year. You know, if we reach a hundred dollars a barrel by the end of this year, and the Fed moves on another interest rate hike, and that's where they want to be. They want to be at the median. I think they said the median target uh, at five point six for the median target. So that's one more 
quarter of a point interest rate hike, then it's going to be quite chaotic going into the election year. That's going to have to, that will change everything based on where we are now versus where we are going. Because the the voter by then, if you think about this, if we're looking at $100 a barrel and interest rates at a median interest target rate at 5.6, which means 30-year mortgages will be close to, on the average, 8% and hitting the brakes on the economy. That's what it's designed to do. These interest rates, rate hikes are designed. By design, they do it to slow the economy. You're doing it right in time for election year. It's going to be chaos. 86690-RED-EYE. Hi, I'm Jen Loomis, a transport safety expert at J.J. Keller, and I'm here to share a tip on roadside inspections. Once a roadside inspection is completed, the officer will close it out, which involves the officer writing or typing up the report. The more the officer found during the inspection, the longer this will take. If violations were discovered, most officers, as a courtesy, will explain the violations to the driver. If there were any out-of-service violations, the officer will normally explain what must be done to get the out-of-service order lifted. Drivers need to be very attentive during this part of the inspection. The driver also needs to read and understand the complete inspection report. After receiving the inspection report, the driver has 24 hours to get the roadside inspection report to the motor carrier. If the driver will not be returning to a company facility within the next 24 hours, the driver needs to know to get it on the way to you via email, mail, or fax within 24 hours. This tip was brought to you by J.J. Keller & Associates. Visit us at jjkeller.com. Lines open for your calls. 866-90-RED-EYE on Red Eye Radio. It's Red Eye Radio. He's Eric Carley, and I'm Gary McNamara. Then you and I looking at the number that uh, the uh, refinancing of homes up 13.2%. Well, it says the demand was up 13.2%. Is that applications? Or? Yeah, the, the mortgage demand surge is 13.2% despite uh, high rates. Yeah, re, re, the ref, uh, appli- on the refi. Applications. Yeah, okay, applications. For, for right. refinancing okay. mortgage Right. Uh, unexpectedly surged last week despite ri- rising interest rates. Mortgage Baggers, uh, Baggers, Bankers Association said the overall mortgage applications rose 5.4% last week. Purchase mortgage applications rose 2.3%. Refinancies, refinancings jumped 13.2%. Well, a couple of things. Uh, do people think, okay, uh, on the refi, I need if I'm going to get money out, I need to do that before they raise rates again? And then on that, also, the same thing on a purchase. Well, you know, going up 2%. Well, maybe I should apply now before it goes up too high, too much work. Uniden America Studios. And he's Eric Carley, and I'm Gary McNamara. So as uh, reading this from uh, Breitbart Finance about uh, refinancing going up uh, the demand, uh, 13.2%, the rise in refinancings could signal that some households are feeling financially strained by persistent inflation and turning their home equity into finance spending. Some homeowners may be also worried that rates will keep climbing or stay at uh, current levels. Right. Yeah, if you if you're afraid if you're looking if you were planning on, you know, the purchase is going up 2%, that's kind of curious to me because I guess it's if it's it could be a, a likely a lot of that is relocation or you already had something in the works in terms of uh you know, you saved for years maybe for a down payment and and you planned, you don't do this overnight usually unless you're moving for work. 
And some of that could be people relocating to a new area. You think about moving from California to Texas, the difference in the valuation on property between California and Texas, even with the higher interest rates, people will still make a purchase based on the fact that here in our area, four or five hundred thousand will get you a, a very nice house. And in California, uh, one bedroom and a detached garage. <laughs> and it's, you know, so the valuation difference, people see that still as a bargain, even with high interest yeah, rates. Yeah, well, if you come out, if you come out, you sell your home and you got yeah. quite a bit of equity in mm-hmm. it, you got a pile of cash and you're moving to Texas or, or even if, wherever you're even moving. If you, yeah, even if you and, don't and your budget was different, you know, there and you look at it and go, well, I'm going to be making the same money. Money, yeah. So the difference yeah, in the valuation... Way, right you know, is makes up for the higher interest rates. Now, that doesn't apply very often. That would be the anomaly. Um, But certainly, you know, on refis, the demand, this demand going up over 13 percent is indicative of people wanting to pull some equity out of their home and turn that into cash. Now, it's only a a one week sample. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. we'll see whether it continues Mm -hmm. on that, whether. It, it rises, but because if it does and you see it continue, that could be because because that gets to uh, in in now in my opinion now I've always viewed money that would be the absolute last recourse if I've got equity in my home that I'm going to do. And some people are probably in right. that position. And 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 especially if I'm especially if I'm paying a lower interest rate, you know, on my mortgage to begin with. Why am I going to refinance any part of that? So it, it, there there could be a number of equations, and again, nothing applies to all, but the possibilities mm-hmm, right. include like, okay, I'm going to be leaving this area. I'm going to be selling this home in the next year. So what I'll do is I'll take out. Now, this doesn't likely doesn't apply anywhere close to this 13% demand or to everyone in this 13% uh, higher demand category. But, um, you know, some people might say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to convert this but I'm going to take some of the, the money out now, uh, put some money into it so I can sell it, put some money, uh, take some money out of it so that I can pay some bills off before I move. Um, or they're just in a situation where I don't really have a choice. And, you know, if you're looking at, if if you've already gone to the point where you, you're exploring it and you're getting close to that application, a lot of those banks will say, okay, look, uh, you're in a good situation. Uh, even with higher interest rates, you're probably going to qualify for this. But you want to do it now because the Fed may move and you may be paying a, a quarter or a half percent more, which is going to add to your payments. Mm-hmm. So I think it's probably a mix of all the above. But yeah, that 13.2 percent. Yeah, the 13.2 is, is the, the big one. Well, but but certainly that also applies to people, you know, because if you're thinking about it, and you've been working with uh, someone at a bank, a, a mortgage uh, professional, uh, they're going to tell you that. They're going to say, look, you know, it could be even higher because a refi uh, has a number of, of uh, it's it's usually a little bit higher than a purchase uh, on the rate. And unless you qualify for that, you know, the lowest rate possible, but even then you're still looking at the possibility of the Fed moving on it. Yeah, but but the reason that you're doing it mm-hmm. to get the cash is the reason. I know that, but I'm talking right, about something, you, a, a right. separate element from it. What I'm saying is where it could drive that demand in that one week is that people are saying, okay, you better do it now. You better get that cash out now because right. the price for getting that cash out could increase if the Fed moves oh, again. Oh, yeah, I understand the reason. Mm-hmm. I, uh, yeah, that absolutely makes sense. So when you look at that what, that what, kind of, de- well, you know, demand surge. But what, I'm, but what I'm viewing is the desperation to do that mm-hmm. so you don't have to pay that quarter of a percent more at a much higher interest rate than, you know, you're, you were paying on your mortgage to begin with. Right, right. And it depends on the individual. You know, I mean, yeah. it's, it, it, it's uh, you know, uh, some people may be in that situation where, I don't really, I don't, I I can't do anything more on credit cards, but I have some equity in the home. And And, so. And it is cheaper than credit cards. mm -hmm. Yeah. So 
that's going to be, you know, now, that's that is going to be a you, solid option for a lot of people. Now you could lose your house, though. That's the only. Thing. Well, if you can't keep up with the payments, then right. you've got worse problems. Right. You, that's that's not even a consideration. If you qualify for the mortgage now, or if you qualify for the refi now, then there's a good chance you're in that, that situation. This could be temporary. A lot of people will do that, um, and many people may be thinking, "Well, I'll go through this now, and in a few years, I'll refinance again." When interest rates drop. Now, I wouldn't count on those interest well, rates to drop, except for the fact that if you get into a situation, you know, we're we're in different territory than we were in in the 70s and, and early 80s because we went it's it's more of a shock to the markets. We, we went from very low interest rates now jumping back up to, you know, the average um, 30 year mortgage is between seven, seven and a half and could get close to eight before it's all over. So that's a huge, significant drop, uh, a jump. It's not the same, uh, situation as we were in, in the late seventies and early eighties, as those rates were going up, that generation was used to those rates being at healthy levels. And I, you know, it's, it's, now we got spoiled to that. We got spoiled with zero interest. Yeah, but that was manipulation by the government. That wasn't the natural. That wasn't the natural flow of what interest rates would be if it was market driven. Well, I, be- I wasn't making the point that it was. It's just no, that- no, 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 no. I'm, 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 that's not what I'm saying. I'm stating mm-hmm. that you're looking. If you're looking out, n- num- number one, when you're saying people looking out, saying when interest rates go down, mm-hmm. and my point is, are we going? This the. Uh, and two points. First off, if uh, your hypothesis comes true that uh, we would have a Gavin Newsom, Michelle Obama, uh, <laughs> uh, president and vice president, which and or then, Oprah, which, which would then <laughs> which would then take us for the next sixteen years, uh-huh. I don't know if that would be smart to say interest rates maybe <laughs> come down in the, in the next couple of years. But and that and the other point I was trying to bring up because that's where my thought process was that if you're waiting for the interest rates to come down. The only way they're going to come down at all to where they are is to go back to the complete government manipulation of interest rates, which is not market driven, that eventually got us to the point because they wanted to buy our own. We bought our own debt, which got us to this point of massive inflation and now a debt situation that's out of control. Well, and and, and, and that those, would are, be, yeah. those are two things that didn't exist at all in the 70s, like it does which is now. exactly where I was going. And it's it's not like where we were before politically or with the mindset of the, the average borrower and consumer. Uh, first of all, the, 80, the 80s really brought about the, the credit card era in terms yeah. of the use of credit cards and and the booming of, of massive retail and 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 malls and everything else where people were OK going and not just taking your your Visa or your Amex, but you were also taking department store credit cards and you were, and it didn't matter. I mean, everybody was like, well, gosh, I can afford the minimum, whatever, $10, $12 a month. No big deal. I'm going shopping with my friends. And, and then, you know, you learn that lesson um, that, that our parents' generation always knew because number one, they didn't have those credit cards. And number two, you really had to prove it back then. You were, you were have to, you had to save your money and then make that purchase. My dad, making their first purchase a home in San Antonio. Uh, and it was, he told me recently, it was just over 16,000, uh, three bedrooms, two baths. And it's a small, small home compared, you know, to, uh, you know, the homes that, that a lot of people live in now, but it was to me as a kid, it was a big home. I mean, it was a great home. Well, the, a lot of the homes were a thousand square feet back then, or less. Well, see, living on base, we in, always in lived. Suburbs. We yeah. always lived in a duplex on base. Yeah. NCO housing wasn't huge, and so it was to us. It wasn't any different. It was a small home, but it just felt like a home. Yeah, you and know, you know, you look at, at at the 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 consumer habits when it comes to things like that too. I don't. Part of it is generational, but a lot of it is also a learned behavior or or maybe just a, a, a change. I, I, I don't know about learned behavior. I, I mean, it is something 
that where we it's a changed mindset, um, whether it's generational or not, they would have to do a study on that. But today, people don't see that building of a, you know, OK, I'm going to build my home. I know I'm going to want to live in this home for 10 years or longer. And I'm going to, you know, because a lot of people look at it. OK, should I buy? Should I rent? Younger people, especially. Should I buy? Should I rent? Well, here's the question. How long are you going to live there? Realistically, do you think you'll live there 10, 12 years from now? Because you're not going to really start building equity unless you walk in with a down payment, especially with higher interest rates. You're not going to start building any real equity unless you're making extra payments. And those are the things that you look at. And I think a lot of people look at it and go, yeah, I don't care if I purchase a house now, uh, still a little bit cheaper than renting. Uh, and if I do stay, I stay. But if I don't, I don't. Because back in the day, you know, our parents' generation, they, many of them still today, don't live far from where they grew up. But today's generation will move from California to Texas for a new mm-hmm. job. You know, I think one of the things you mentioned is, you know, when you when you look at the just the economy in general and and how credit cards really, you know, just exploded in the 80s. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that's so true because I was a bill collector. Instead, in fact, uh, 49 years ago right now, I'd been a bill collector for about five months. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I remember the, the you didn't have, you know, probably the, the huge people didn't have three or four credit cards. Right. You know, with an even comparable looking at today where people will have, you know, three credit cards. Twenty thousand dollars on each, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. sixty thousand dollars available <laughs> yeah. unsecured yeah. credit. Oh, easy. I, I yeah. still, as as somebody who worked in the banking industry, I look at that and going, that's still insane. Yeah, I mean, to have that kind of unsecured credit, and so, but even back then, people would have a credit card. But the people that were making money, I know that one of the things I collected was the unsecured line of credit. But mm-hmm. they only went to people that had a history. You know, they had a good they had people that went in now and the history might not have been all your credit rating, but you went into the bank and the bank manager knew who you were. Yeah. And knew who right, your yeah. family was and knew what your payment history was and knew so much about you. And that's how you really sort of got that line of credit. Mm-hmm. I got my first credit card 49 years ago. And the only reason I got it was because I worked for the bank. Yeah. And so I had one of the first debit cards, ATM cards. Right in the country, right, and the you they they didn't have debit cards. Mm-hmm. There were you just didn't have a card where you had your checking account attached to it. Right, there was a credit card that you could use in it. They attached our checking account to it, and then therefore had to give us credit. My first credit line was one hundred dollars. Yeah, right. Yeah, no, my uh, oldest granddaughter just got a credit card, and I think the credit line is a few hundred dollars, and she knows what she's doing. She knows. It's only to build a credit history. You know, Mm -hmm. my oldest brother, for the longest time, didn't have any credit history whatsoever. He paid cash for everything. Uh, To a point, he wasn't married. He had been single for a long, long time. He bought his vehicles, paid cash. He saved up. He paid rent. He rented apartments because he moved quite a bit. And so when he wanted to borrow for a new vehicle, it was like, well, we don't have any idea who you are. <laughs> and so, you know, that, that yeah. he had to start that later in life. And now he owns a home and it's paid for and everything else. But you have to start that that history. And, and that's how they know who you are these days. Exactly. 866-90-RED-EYE. Get in touch with Red Eye Radio. Toll free at 866-90-RED-EYE. It's Red Eye Radio. He is Eric Curley, and uh, I'm Gary McNamara. Coming up on the top of uh, the hour, will there be an agreement between the writers and the movie studios? Nah, it could come sometime today. And the producers and all that. And they say if not, it'll go till the end of the year? Yep. Wow.
This is Red Eye Radio on Westwood One.